Chapter 11 A Line from Plain to Ground The men decided to begin the gift drops to the savage Akas at the earliest possible moment, employing the spiraling line technique that Nate Saint had pioneered in Etchwara country. There, the accuracy of delivery had been of paramount importance. In the new venture, the technique would have the additional value of making it clear to the Akas that the visitors in the plane had the power to give or retain the gift right up until the moment of delivery. From captive Akas it had been learned that the Indians thought that the gifts from the shell plane fell out of its stomach as a result of its being wounded or scared by the lances they had thrown. Nate typed out his continuing record of the start of Operation Akka. That night on the living room floor, it was decided that we would make our aerial visits regularly, leaving something different each week in order to work on their curiosity. We calculated that under the circumstances, sooner or later the hostile spirit would melt. The following day, Johnny flew Jim and Ed back to Arajuno. At Shell Mara, I began tests with the line to see what kind of simple, dependable mechanism we could use to release our gifts when they touched the ground. Johnny and I flew together on most of the tests and Marge and Ruth hooked on the test weights and watched their release on the runway. We marked off a target on the runway and tried to hit it. Finally we were ready for a dress rehearsal. The test went off fine, except that when we flew over the strip to drop the line, it felled the strut and we had to tie a knife on a stick so that we could try to cut it loose. There was no danger except that it could have come loose by itself while we were not over the field. And that is just what happened. I saw the line drape itself in some tall trees, just beyond the end of the runway. However, by the time we landed and got in there to hunt for it, it was too dark, so that it had to remain there till morning. That night I was so keyed up I couldn't sleep much. On the other hand, I realized that the whole thing was in the Lord's hands. I had no way of knowing how long it would take the next morning to get the line out of the trees but I told Marge that if I could be ready to take off by 9 a.m. we would go through with it, if not, we'd cancel until the following day. Next morning, I rigged a fishing line with a weight that I could toss over the lost line high in the trees. With that and a lot of trudging around through brush, I finally got all the line and by 9 a.m. we were ready for takeoff. October 6, 1955 The first gift was a small aluminum kettle with a lid. Inside we put about twenty brightly colored buttons, obviously not for their non-existent clothes. But buttons do make good ornaments. Also, we included a little sack with a few pounds of rock salt. We understand that they do not have any salt of their own. If only they could discover what the stuff was good for we felt sure we'd win friends. To these things, we attached some fifteen brightly colored ribbon streamers about a yard long. All was ready. Out at Arajuno, all was readiness and happy anticipation. I was very anxious, lest by some fault of mine, we might miss on this first attempt. We loaded in our emergency equipment, rigged our special gear, made a dry run test of getting the rig overboard, and took off for points east. We could hardly believe that we were to have the privilege of making the initial effort. Fifteen minutes flying brought us over the first clearings. It was Ed's first look at his neighbors and he was plenty keyed up about it. We decided to try to find the downstream edge of their domain, so that if we had a forced landing, we could travel downstream away from their territory. About fifteen minutes more of looking around assured us that we were over the house that interested us. We were about three thousand feet above the ground, and could not see anyone below, yet every indication showed that the house was occupied. The large house was thatched, with round ends, Javaro style, and around it were several smaller squarish houses with thatched roofs, square on the ends. Well-beaten paths linked the smaller houses to the large central one. The main house was about forty yards from the edge of the stream and had a nice playa, sandbar, in front of it, perhaps seventy-five yards long and twenty-five yards wide at the widest place. A path showed that they used the playa frequently. It would be our target. We slowed the plane to 55 miles per hour and held the gifts over the side, the door having been removed at Arajuno, and hooked up the automatic release mechanism. Slowly we lowered the gift packet until it was well clear of the plane. Then we allowed the airspeed to come up to 65 and began the heart-racking job of reeling out the line. I say heart-racking because if there is a bad knot anywhere in the bundle of cord, the whole effort is lost for that time. But all went well and we began circling at about 65 miles per hour. 
Since our altimeter reads only the altitude above sea level, we had no way of knowing how high we were above the ground. No sign of life below. We continued circling until the gift was drifting in a small, lazy circle below us, ribbons fluttering nicely. If no one was watching, it made it more important that we put the gift in an obvious place. The gift still seemed pretty high, so we started spiraling down, noting a considerable wind drift from the north, necessitating correction every time around in order to keep us over the target. Finally, the gift appeared to be pretty close to the trees below. Time for the attempt. The wind was making it difficult and the hills on either side of the stream were covered with tall trees. A couple of times it seemed that we snatched our charge upward just in the nick of time to keep it out of trees bordering the sandbar. Once I believe the ribbons dragged across a tree and hung up momentarily. At any rate, that gave us our working elevation. We made about six attempts at this elevation, gradually drifting the prize against the wind until it was over the bar. Then we rolled the turn steeper and held our breath while it lowered toward the earth. It wouldn't be ideal for it to hit the water, and it was heading close, close, closer, plunk. It hit about two or three feet from the water, directly in line with the path to the house. They couldn't miss it, since they probably got their water for cooking right at that spot. Now another problem. I thought I saw our gift move, just a little as we began a slow climb, still circling. That raised the question as to whether it was released or dragging on the line. But finally we were sure the line was free, and there was our messenger of goodwill, love, and faith, 2,000 feet below on the sandbar. In a sense, we had delivered the first gospel message by sign language to a people who were a quarter of a mile away vertically, 50 miles horizontally, and continents and wide seas away psychologically. How much do these people know? What do they think of what little they have seen of the outside world? We know they used to watch airplanes of the Shell Oil Company land and take off at Arajuno, for the Shell workers saw the spots where they hid in the bush to watch these monstrous messengers of another world. The trip back to Arajuno was short and happy. Back home again, everybody who was in on the secret wanted to know if we had seen any Akas. They were a little skeptical about anyone's finding our gift when we confessed we hadn't seen a soul. Nevertheless, a start had been made. Friday, October 14, 1955 I haven't brought the narrative up to the moment, but rather than let the hottest stuff cool off while I catch up, I'm going to go ahead with what just happened today. This morning, the weather was good, so we took off around 8 a.m. On the way out, we could see some early morning fog still lingering in the river valleys to the east, so we were in no great hurry. We landed at Arajuno and began to prepare for the drop, which was to be a new machete. We understand that these people have killed for machetes. That is, they have killed people working in the fields in order to steal their machetes or axes. It is easy to imagine the importance of such items among a Stone Age people. We wrapped the blade in canvas so that no one would get cut and then tied on a number of colored ribbon streamers. After rigging the automatic touch-release gadget, we climbed in the plane for a dress rehearsal. Going over all our plans and precautions again, it seemed that we were ready, so we had a word of prayer for the success of the trip and took off. It is always a bit of a strain on me to reel out the line in the air. But I slowed the plane down and we carefully lowered our second messenger of good will over the side. By the time the line was all out, we were almost at our destination. We used a little less line this time than last. Our plan was to check the sandbar where we left the gift last week. There were some low clouds, but we found the house and the sandbar. The gift was gone. The binoculars removed any doubt. Either they had accepted it or a flood had taken it away. We saw no one, but it was evident that the site was well occupied. The plan was to fly upstream, to the next house, this time, and leave the gift there. We figured that if we specialized on one house, the others might get jealous or become suspicious that the occupant of that house was in league with us, or was in some way a traitor to their cause. When we got to the target house, we found it directly under a cloud so we inferred that the Lord would have us go on to the next. As we approached the house we had decided on, we spotted three or four canoes pulled up to the stream bank in front of the house. That was interesting because one report has it, they don't have canoes, but there they were. That meant, too, that somebody must be around nearby. 
As we started to circle about 2,500 feet above the house it became apparent that we were going to be inside the cloud about 10% of the time, but all other conditions seemed so favorable that we decided to go ahead. The high-riding machete was behaving nicely. Ed was glued to the binoculars. All of a sudden, he let out a yell and all but crawled out the open door to get a better look. We were seeing our first Aka. He was running around, but not hiding. Pretty soon there were three of them out in front of their big leaf-covered house. Now we felt sure that they had received our gift of last week and that the idea had caught on in a hurry. If it was half the sport for them that it was for us, their excitement was understandable. After about four circles, we had compensated for the wind, etc., and started letting the gift down. I was no longer worried about their getting it because we felt sure they were already watching the dangling prize. We let on down. At first it looked as if it would hit the house, but it drifted toward the stream. Splash. Then, quicker than you could bat an eye, another splash, and Aka had dived after the treasure. Minutes later, there must have been a half dozen or eight of the men on the bank examining the prize. Our hearts were grateful. We had not hoped to see this for perhaps months. Of course, we wonder what they were thinking. Several things seemed evident. They got our first gift. They aren't afraid of us in this type of approach. They are as animated, in one way or another, about this thing as we are. Back at Arajuno, Ed learned another interesting bit of news. His local Indians reported the tracks of Akas who had apparently hidden in the brush near Ed's house to observe what was going on there. Although there was no way of verifying this conjecture, it was credible. A Quechua woman, Hoakina, who had been captured by the Akas and later escaped, had once told Dr. Tidmarsh that it was the Akas' practice to sit on a certain hill overlooking the camp at Arajuno to observe what went on. It seemed that they had an intricate espionage system, which perhaps at this very moment was operating near the McCulley's house. The men planned to make a wooden model of the plane, with ribbons dangling from it, to hang outside Ed's house in order to identify Ed with the operation. Eight days after writing the previous report, Nate Saint typed a heading on a fresh sheet of tissue. Report on the third visit to the neighbors. He continued, We refer to the Akas as neighbors and to their area as the neighborhood to avoid the use of the name on the radio, or in the hearing of those who aren't supposed to be interested. We couldn't go out on visitation on Thursday as we had planned because the army called on us for a flight down the Karare River in the interior looking for the body of a soldier who had drowned. We did not see any sign of the missing man, but we did see a lot of Ecuador that lies beyond habitation. We understand that beyond the area we checked, out toward the Napo, some vestiges of civilization reappear. However, we flew for 45 minutes, following every curve in the river without seeing a single sign of human life, saw a little wildlife, several taper, some giant turtles, and an abundance of birds of paradise, beautiful things gliding over the woods below. Next day, Ed and I got away from Arajuno at about 11 o'clock while Mary Lou kept all the Indians in school so they wouldn't ask too many difficult questions. First we flew down the Carare looking for possible campsites or temporary landing strip sites. This was 40 or 50 miles above the start of the area searched yesterday for the missing soldier. We saw some interesting possibilities, but nothing ideal for an airstrip. However, up on the horizon, along the ridges we saw something that looked like smoke. It seemed to be about the place where the Akas are, so we decided to have a look. Maybe the boys had a smudge going, so we'd be sure to find them with our gift bag. The smoke turned out to be the remnant of a low cloud, but we found ourselves over the Aka neighborhood at a lower altitude than we'd ever been before, and took the occasion to circle each of the four main houses and take some pictures. We saw Indians all over some running down the stream bed from the manioc patch, toward home, others coming from other directions. They didn't seem at all afraid. We shouted Aka phrases until we were hoarse. After we circled the house where we had received such an open reception last week, and flew on toward the next house, the Indians apparently thought the show was scheduled there for this week, and all took off down the stream bed to try to be in on it. At any rate, when we decided to repeat at the same house to reward their confidence, we came back over and found the place deserted except for what appeared to be two women. But soon the menfolk came charging back up the stream bed. 
There must have been big excitement down there. This week our gift was to be another aluminum pot containing a bunch of trinkets and beads, well ribboned. We also tied on a little 10-inch Indian basket, empty, in hopes they might put something in it and send it back up. But somehow or other, after we got the whole thing clear of the plane, the automatic release failed and we lost the kettle to the jungle below, perhaps 300 yards distant from a smaller manioc patch. It seems likely that they might find it, but not too probable since everyone was over at the big clearing waiting for the show to begin. We were already getting a little tired from all the photographing and shouting to them, but we felt we mustn't leave without giving them something, so we tied on a new machete from our emergency kit, left on the little basket, and lowered the whole works without any release mechanism. One of the more tiring elements on this trip was the rough air. We were constantly bouncing around and had a snappy drift from the northeast, so that our machete drifted badly. Several times when it was lowering near them, they would scramble helter-skelter in that direction. It is really great sport. We don't know whether or not they have any system for determining who gets the prize. But as long as the supply holds up, they should all keep encouraged. Finally after a couple of near misses, we set the packet within ten feet of the front door of their house. They had it immediately and took it out on the riverbank. Here the wind fouled up the works because every time around I had to roll completely out of the turn to compensate for drift and thus stay over the house. And every time I'd roll out of the turn, the pull on the line got really hard. They must have had the line for several minutes. We could not tell whether they were putting anything in the basket or not. They may have put in something too heavy to pick up, or they may have tied the line to something. At any rate, we finally saw one fellow run diagonally into the river and stop abruptly and do something, suggesting that he was unsnagging the line. I felt the line loosen and we were free. We shouted at each other about the thrill of holding a line, the other end of which Anaka held. Our next decision was to fly past them low enough so that they could see us. That meant pulling in the entire line, a tough job, but after ten minutes of hard work we had it all in. Then down we circled. As we got lower, the crowd, formerly eight or ten, thinned out until there were only two or three in sight. We had another little bundle of ribbon to throw out as we went by. We tossed the ribbon from about two hundred feet and a brown-skinned man had it like the spider takes a fly. We shouted. From the man's gestures and from past experience in similar operations among other Indians, I feel sure that the man shouted back to us flailing his arms. He was the only one in sight and when we circled around the other side of the house he ran in one side of the house and out the other. I felt a keen disappointment as I thought how frightened they must have been when we swooped low. However, as we circled slowly higher and higher, they seemed to regain confidence and slowly reappeared. Finally, everyone seemed to be present. How we hoped that they regained their party spirit and laughed off their fright. Going away, we flew directly toward the Carare, since we feel more and more that that will be the site of the first contact if the Lord is pleased to continue blessing our efforts. Chapter 12 The Savages Respond From all appearances, the Akas understood the white man's attempt to introduce himself. They seemed to recognize the regularity of the flights and in successive weeks appeared in large numbers, more eager than ever to receive the gifts. Had they any idea of reciprocating? What were their real reactions? For the fourth flight, Nate rigged up the plane with a battery-powered loudspeaker. As they approached the clearings, Jim called out the Aka words, I like you. I am your friend. I like you. Then they dropped another machete, wrapped and decorated as usual. Jim's diary describes the reaction. A group raced back into the trees behind the house, and one lone man walked to the beach. He cupped his hands and seemed to shout, then flashed the new machete over his head. We dropped a small aluminum pot, with ribbons. It contained a yellow shirt and beads. The Akas below us converged on it like women at a bargain counter, as Nate put it, and one was soon flailing the shirt. As we approached the house, two canoes some distance below it going downstream, turned and came back upstream, hurriedly. At one time I noticed people come running up through the water onto the beach, and another time a single one with a white cloth. 
We returned via the Curare, looking for possible landing beaches. Hope's not good. Guide us, Lord God. Back at Arajuno, the three pioneers had a council of war, deciding that the next full moon would witness the first attempt at a contact on the ground with these remote people who had won their hearts. Nate wrote that night, May God continue to put his good hand on the project and may we drop it when not fully assured of his direction. At present, we feel unanimously that God is in it. May the praise be his, and may it be that Samaka, clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, will be with us as we lift our voices in praise before his throne. Amen. On the next trip, their reception was even more favorable. McCulley manned the mic to call out, We like you. We like you. We have come to pay a visit. The Akas danced about eagerly, grabbing the machete the men had thrown, and stripped its canvas so that it shone in the sun. While circling low, Ed leaned far out the door and held out both hands. The Indians, about three of them, responded by reaching out their hands too. Ed's observations on this trip were. No fear manifest today, even when the plane was down low. No running inside or away. Most stood under the banana trees, possibly because of the sun. The plane gets close but somehow one longs to get closer. No sign of malice or anger. No lance is seen. If there were a ladder down from the plane to them it would seem a good and safe thing to go among them. By this time each man on the team had had time to form a judgment. The team has a spectrum that ranges from impatience to conservatism, wrote Nate. Pete, who constantly conferred with the other three, did not feel that the next full moon was the right time for the first attempt at contact. It was too soon to assume that a long-standing hatred of white men had been overcome. The language problem was a big one, and it lay within their power to gain more knowledge of it, by working with Dayuma, the escaped Aka woman from whom Jim had gathered his material. Ed's reaction was that the next move should not necessarily be an effort at contact but rather the establishment of a usable airstrip down the Carare, perhaps within five miles of the neighborhood. Meanwhile, Jim was chewing the bit. If a friendly contact were made, Jim and I were prepared to leave the work in Shandia, for a time, and go in and live among the Akas. Nate felt that the men should follow the already established course of making regular contacts and that nothing should be done suddenly, but that each advance be allowed to soak in before pressing another. On November 12th, Nate Saint returned to his self-imposed task of keeping the record of Operation Aka. He wrote, This was the sixth week in succession that we have visited the neighbors. It was a beautiful Saturday morning. There wasn't much cargo to go along, nor much fog in the river valleys, so I got out to Ed's place at about 8.30 a.m. He was waiting at the airstrip when I arrived. We took off with the public address system and reel aboard. Ed had a machete and a small aluminum pot and a large aluminum pot set up with ribbons. Again, we flew down the Carare at low altitude so as to familiarize ourselves with the sandbars and various possible landing locations along the river. With familiarity, the sandbars look increasingly useful for our purposes. When we got to the point where we were closest to the neighbors, we decided that rather than turn into them, we would fly on down the big river to see if perhaps there might not be some ideal landing spot farther down. We found none. Then we decided that since we were down that far, we'd go a little farther and turn back up the little branch river along which the Akas live. We flew, perhaps eight to ten minutes, up the small river, before we stumbled onto a house, one that we hadn't seen before. It had the coarser leaf type of roof, which slanted all the way to the ground, a gable roof. The ends of the house were also of leaf and slanted, perhaps 10 to 15 degrees out from the vertical. We saw no one by whom we could judge the size of the house. It appeared to be smaller than the others, but if in reality it is smaller, then the doors and the ends were such as to require one to stoop quite low to enter. Outside the house were two distinct plantings, two patches. The taller growth was darker green and covered, perhaps an acre. It did not appear to be manioc, being taller and thicker in the foliage cover. But, the interesting thing was that the plot was surrounded by a well-made fence comprised of upright posts perhaps six feet apart, interwoven with what could have been opened-up bamboo basket weave style, so that apparently an animal larger than a cat might not be able to pass through the fence. 
After circling three times, to have a good look, we headed upstream to the next house, which was the one we had previously supposed to be the most easterly of this group. This house is also the one at which we did the first line drop of the little pailful of buttons. Here for the first time now on this trip we saw people, about six, I would guess. One went out on the sandbar where we had left the kettle before and waited patiently. When we waved and yelled, he waved but not with the enthusiasm that is always displayed at the other place. We supposed that he was an older fellow. His body appeared to be smeared with something opaque such as clay. There were no clothes in evidence. We made a run and dropped him a machete, free fall. It landed right on the sandbar and was carried off, with relatively little ceremony or enthusiasm. Nevertheless, there seemed to be no demonstration of hostility whatsoever, nor fear. We went on, after shouting with the public address system that we were friends. At the next house we ran across a few of the neighbors on the sandbar. We flew quite low, shouting and waving to them without using the public address system. Then we dropped them the little pot. It hit the playa near them and was enthusiastically received. They jumped around quite excitedly. Also at this house, let's number them from the east, making this one number three, we noticed two items especially. First, at either side of the doorway were boards, perhaps twenty-five inches wide and about five feet high decorated with bold, bright red decorations. I suppose they are doors of some sort. The other item of note was that the owners had made a woven leaf end for their house, heretofore it has been open where it faced on the river. From there we went on to house number four, which is the one we visited most often and at which we've been received with the most evident enthusiasm. There was a good crowd on hand to welcome us. And to our surprise, out behind their house where there had been a stand of trees and undergrowth, there was now a clean clearing about seventy-five to ninety yards in diameter. Some of the stumps were still there, but aside from that it was as clean as a basketball court. From the reaction of the people below, I would guess that they couldn't decide whether to expect the drop on their new clearing, or whether we would drop it down by the house as has been the custom. Ed's diary picks up the account of this day's operation. We went in low and through an axe head, wrapped in canvas. It lit just on the west side of the clearing in the bushes. They pounced on it immediately. Then we yelled. We will give you a pot, and went up higher. Tied on the pot, and reeled it out. This was a definite leading of God, for we had almost decided to throw the pot free instead of bothering with the line. Nate made a perfect drop. I held the line and could feel their holding on to it. They cut the pot off, and tied something on. Nate spotted it and praised the Lord. When we got back to Arajuno, we found that it was a laytu or headband of woven feathers. A real answer to prayer, another sign to proceed, an encouragement that friendly relations are possible and that they will hear the gospel. On November 26, Nate Saint recorded later developments. Last week, since Ed was not back from Quito in time for the usual run, Jim Elliott took it on with me. I picked him up in Shandia after doing some shuttling between Pano and Tena and Pano and Shandia. We stopped by Arajuno and picked up the gear. There were two Indians near the plane and despite our caution, they apparently managed to find out what was in the supply and said to Jim, why do you crazy fellows give all that good stuff to Akas? Jim ignored the question, but it meant quite surely that the secret was more or less out, even though they could not know any of the details. We flew, as I recall, quite directly to the neighborhood and started visiting around. At number four house, two men had climbed up on top of what we had previously thought of as a sun shelter, a high bamboo roof or platform perhaps six feet off the ground. We circled low several times and decided to go ahead with a previously discussed plan aimed at getting them to cut down the trees at the far side of the clearing as a sort of approach or go around, which would permit us to fly low enough for them to see us so as to be able to recognize us later on the ground. The plan was to drop our gifts into the trees we wanted down. First we dropped an axe head. Unfortunately, it landed at the foot of the trees in question. Next time around, we tossed out four plastic cones with streamers of bandage material tied on them. Happily a couple of them at least got hung up in the trees. Next we went to number three. Everyone was out in great style. One man had one of our gift shirts on. 
the rest were in more typical uniform. We circled and waved and then went on down to the old man's house. He was out with his two women. We didn't feel that he warranted too good a gift, so we tossed him a pair of store-bought trousers. After circling back to make sure he got them okay, we went on back to number three. We tossed the people there a machete with a pair of shorts attached. From here, we climbed on up over number four to get ready to let down the kettle for the last act of the day. I neglected to mention earlier that in rummaging in the emergency kit Ed had made up, we found a roll of tissue. We thought it might help to get those tall trees down if we were to drape the tissue along the treetops. Such a drop might seem to be utilizing their curiosity to an unfair advantage, but on the other hand, they were amply repaid for any trouble that they went to. When we tossed the roll, however, it reeled off about six feet and then the wind tore off that length. This process was repeated until there was a curious white dotted line floating down into the trees. The wind was rather strong today and I had trouble staying over the clearing as we let the kettle down. It required some six or eight attempts before the kettle landed in the little river at the edge of the clearing. They were at it in an instant. But in that same instant, I had to roll out of the turn-up wind to keep from getting too far from the clearing. That put quite a pull on the line at the moment they were trying to work with it. In about thirty seconds, they let it go. It appeared to have a gift on it, something small, perhaps, like the combs, received earlier with the headband. As we left the area I called in and reported that we were on our way back. Marge answered that the drowned baby was sick and that I should make the best possible time so as to be able to fly into Makuma if necessary. Therefore, I flew at 70 miles per hour and somewhere along the line we lost the gift. About halfway back I noticed that it was missing. It was a keen disappointment. In Jim's account of this day's operation, he said, I saw a thing that thrilled me. It seemed an old man who stood beside the house waved with both his arms as if to signal us to come down. Akas, waving to me to come. God send me soon to the Akas. At the end of his record of the eighth visit, Nate wrote, One of the problems we face now is getting another man to bring our manpower up to strength. The Lord is abundantly able. Although five men would eventually make up Operation Akka, only three, Nate, Jim, and Ed, were definitely committed at this time. Pete, who had been as vitally interested as these three, was, however, not clear whether God's leading was for him to go or to stay. It was now that Nate thought of Roger Udirian. They had worked together opening up the Atshwara country, building two other outstation airstrips, and Nate was sure of Roger's capabilities. He saw him as a soldier of Christ, a man capable of great effort, trained and disciplined, he wrote of him. He knows the importance of unswerving conformity to the will of his captain. Obedience is not a momentary option, it is a die-cast decision made beforehand. He was a disciplined paratrooper. He gave Uncle Sam his best in that battle and now he is determined that the Lord Jesus Christ shall not get less than his best. Everything that made him a good soldier has been consecrated to Christ, his new captain. Ed and Jim hardly knew Roger. Working with different Indians in another part of the Orient, they had had little occasion for more than a passing acquaintance. But they trusted Nate's judgment implicitly. As it happened, Roger was in Shelmera at this time. He had come out from Makuma to help build a mission-sponsored hospital there. So one day, as Roger was nailing down sheets of aluminum on the roof, Nate came to him, told him of Operation Aka, and asked him to go along as the badly needed fourth man. Nate did not want to leave his plane on the beach at night where it might be open to damage. Neither was he anxious to leave the two men alone overnight. Would Raj go? Roger agreed immediately. But all unknown to the others, he was, at that time, passing through a deeply personal spiritual struggle and he began to wonder if he should join the others in the physical venture when not with them completely in spirit. Only he and Barbara were aware of the struggle he was going through. He questioned whether, after all, he was accomplishing anything whatever in the mission field. He had broken the language barrier, to be sure, but why had there not been an immediate show of fruit for his labors? A missionary plods through the first year or two, thinking that things will be different when he speaks the language. He is baffled to find, frequently, that they are not. He is stripped of all that may be called. Romance Life has fallen more or less into a pattern. 
Day follows day in unbroken succession. There are no crises, no mass conversions, sometimes not even one or two to whom he can point and say, there is a transformed life. If I had not come, he would never have known Christ. There will be those among the Indians who say that they accept Christ, but what of the forsaking of heathen custom and turning from sin to a life of holiness? The missionary watches, and longs, and his heart sickens. The forces of evil, unchallenged for so long, are now set in array against the missionary. Roger Udarian was finding out the power of these forces. He wrote in his diary, about ready to call it quits. Seems to me there is no future in the Javeria for us, and the wisest thing for us to do will be to pull stakes. We'll wait until I've had a chance to talk it over with Barb and see what she has to say. We might pass Christmas here, finish the hospital in Shell, and head home. The reason, failure to measure up as a missionary and get next to the people. As far as my heart and aspirations are concerned, the issue is settled. It's a bit difficult to discern just what is the cause of my failure and the forces behind it. Since March, when we left Wambimi, there has been no message from the Lord for us. I just picked up my Bible to share with the same Lord who made me a new creature in England eleven years ago. There was no word of encouragement from Him. He had kept us safe wonderfully and met our needs, but the issue is far greater than that. There is no ministry for me among the Javaros or the Spanish, and I'm not going to try to fool myself. I wouldn't support a missionary such as I know myself to be, and I'm not going to ask anyone else to. Three years is long enough to learn a lesson and learn it well. Some people are slow to catch on. It will be tough on Barb and the children, but I've always been convinced that honesty and sincerity pays. The milk is spilled, I'm not going to cry over it. The cause of Christ in the Javeria will not suffer for our having been there, but I must be honest and confess that it has not been helped. I don't think it will come as much of a surprise to many and will only be an I told you so. There is no spiritual pressure in the issue, and in fact very little of emotion or stress, perhaps none. I realize that many along the way will say that we gave up too easy. Perhaps, but I believe that God's way is to face the issue and let our yeah be yeah and nay be nay. I'm a man for the cause of Christ, but believe that the part one ch, no I cannot say the part one chose, I believe that the Lord chose the Javaria for us but I just didn't measure up to it. You will say that when the Lord calls, He supplies. You can have my boots any time you want them. It isn't there. I'm not good at pretending. I do not put any blame on personalities or circumstances involved, the failure is mine, and my failure to achieve the personal experience of Christ that could meet the needs here. It didn't pan out. It is not because of wife and family. Macuma Station is ample for a home for them and all we need has been offered. The issue is personal, and personal it shall remain. What is the answer? I do not know. And I'm discouraged about finding any satisfactory solution. Have been battling and thinking the issue for many months. There is no answer. It is a combination of situations and talents that has me buffaloed. This is the first time in my life that I have turned my back, but they say there is a first time for everything. We are a happy family. He has kept us well and given us sound bodies and, we trust, sound minds. Whatever he has for us is fine, but I'm afraid that anything along missionary lines has been scared out of me. If I couldn't make the grade here in Makuma, I'm not foolish enough to expect a change of setting would change me. This is my personal Waterloo as a missionary. It seems strange to try and sit back and view it in an impersonal way. Of this much, I'm sure, it will draw me to read his word more be more tolerant of others, and less venturesome in my activities. Some will wonder why we don't seek a place in the Spanish or Quechua work. Frankly, I'm not interested. And, especially after this experience, I'm not begging for any more headaches. Only a fool makes the same mistake twice. One mess seems to me ought to be enough. Here I sit at 11 a.m. Wednesday, listening to the services. I told them from the window that I would not come. First they sang wonderful words of life, and then oh say, but I'm glad. I found an English hymn book to see if there might be some consolation in a hymn. There is none. It is beyond me. My, what a world of time I've wasted. 
The ruts are worn deep and it won't be easy to change habits and give up the lost ground or let it be gained by the Lord. But surely it will be worth the battle. My mind was made only to love him, my body, also, which includes my tongue and all its activities. How slow some of us are to learn. I will be led and taught of the Holy Spirit. God desires full development, use, and activity of our faculties. The Holy Spirit can and will guide me in direct proportion to the time and effort I will expend to know and do the will of God. I must read the Bible to know God's will. At every point I will obey and do. A week spent in Shelmera, prior to this period, when I reiterated many times a day that will be done, helped much to fortify me for this struggle. Roger had not yet emerged from his dark night of the soul when Nate approached him. The days which followed found him in a desperate struggle to know the will of God. He had no doubt of his own desire, he would go if that were all that mattered. But to go without the smile of God that would be impossible. If thy presence, go not with us, carry us not up hence. Roger recognized something of what this decision might mean for him, and the hours spent on his knees with God witnessed agony of soul. But God, who causes us to triumph, brought him out of his slew of despond. He was cleansed through the Spirit for the task that lay ahead of him, said Barbara afterward, and went with a happy, expectant mind and his heart full of joy. On December 19 he wrote in his diary, I will die to self. I will begin to ask God to put me in a service of constant circumstances where to live. Christ I must die to self. I will be alive unto God. That I may learn to love him with my heart, mind, soul, and body. Just before he left Makuma to join the four in Arajuno, he wrote. There is a seeking of honest love, drawn from a soul storm tossed, a seeking for the gain of Christ, to bless the blinded, the beaten, the lost. Those who sought found heavenly love and were filled with joy divine, they walked today with Christ above. The last line eluded him, and as he put down his pencil, he said, Barb, I'll finish it when I get home. Chapter 13 The Search for Palm Beach Although plans for meeting the Akas on the ground occupied more and more time, the regular weekly visits to Terminal City, the name the men had given to the Aka village, were continued without a break. On December 3rd, Nate recorded the ninth visit. We left Arajuno at about 8.45, with good weather. Before taking off, Ed and I shot some pictures that we hope will be suitable for enlargement up to almost life-size so that the neighbors will recognize us when they first see us on the ground. We took close-ups of our faces, together with the combs and headdress they had given us. When we got over the first house, number four, we noted that a couple of pretty big trees were chopped down where we had tossed the gifts into the trees for that purpose. There are not many trees left now, between the two clearings. If we can get them to cut down the rest, we will be able to make low passes. Once this morning, we swooped down so low that the two men who were up on the platform, directing traffic, ducked down. When we swooped down again, the two were content to view the proceedings from the ground, the platform appeared to be perhaps eight feet off the ground. Both the platform men had on shirts, period, shirts we had given them, of course. In these runs, we dropped an axe head, a plastic cup, and a cheap knife. We tried again to put these in the trees that still separate the two clearings. There were perhaps a half dozen other people around number four. From there we went to number three. As we made a low pass, we nearly fell out of the airplane, for there on the grass roof of the house was a model plane, we wondered if they made it after observing the model plane at Ed's place. In any case it indicates goodwill, and a craftsmanship hitherto unsuspected among such primitives. We noticed another platform, larger and higher than the other, and made of conta. I guess it is fifteen feet off the ground. On top was a man complete with his uniform, shirt. He waved responsively as we waved to him. We made a couple of passes and tossed out a machete so that it fell just beyond the director. We noted that the east wall of leaves was off the house so that we could see inside, fire sights, etc. It was a very friendly looking deal, but it's possible that they are going to put in a conta wall to replace the leaves. Yes, I just checked the photo of number three taken a while back and it shows leaf wall all the way around except at the river end which was open. 
It is easy to see how the availability of even so simple a tool as the machete can profoundly alter a culture. Next we decided to have a close look at a fresh clearing that has been made on the ridge crest, just above number 3. No one was there. We discussed briefly the possible benefits of trying to lure them up and decided to try. First time around we tossed out an aluminum kettle. It was a poor shot and fell into the forest, fortunately on the slope facing the number 3 house. It was then that we noticed that the undergrowth on the slope was in the process of being cleared out. That means that they will be tipping over the trees on that edge of the clearing, which will enable us to fly within 20 feet of them in perfect safety. As a further lure, Ed decided we should toss out a cheap, plastic-handled knife. All these gifts are generously trailed by ribbon and bandage material. In view of the miss with the kettle I said to Ed as we approached, let's put this one right on top of the house referring to the sketchy shelter that must serve as a sunshade while they work on the new clearing project. And that's exactly where it landed, right on the roof. Let's go see how the old man liked his new pants, I suggested. Okay, so we went. He is about two minutes away, from number three. He was waiting for us in pants and t-shirt. His two women were out, two, one. Wore a baby and the other nothing. The area around their house was nicely cleaned up, grass cut down to roots, etc. The old man evidenced the usual reserve and lack of enthusiasm. We dropped him a machete. One of the women had to go get it. His gestures are willing, but slow. We flew by within 200 feet of them about three times, and headed back upriver, to number three. Back at number three area, we checked the hilltop clearing again. From a quarter mile away, I could see that someone was there. We were thrilled by this quick result since we had thought it might take weeks to coax them up. The figures proved to be two women, young, I would say about sixteen and twenty, maybe. They had got the knife and we passed within fifty feet of them taking pictures. We made about four passes and for the first time looked full into an Aka face. She was good-looking with hair cropped to bangs in front. The controller of number three was still on the platform. We waved goodbye to him and headed on toward number four. Back at number four, the boys were all waiting for the last act, the bucket drop. We climbed up to 3,000 feet and slowed down to 45 miles per hour with power off. In this slow, power off glide the kettle gets clear of the plane very nicely. It took only about three times around to set the kettle in the middle of the big clearing behind the house. They ran back and forth in a group, curiously to us. I was afraid that I was piling loose cord in after the kettle, however, it seemed to have too much tension on it for that. Finally, after a minute and a half, they turned it loose and up it came with a gif, bright red and good-sized. We flew back to Arajuno at 55 to 60 miles per hour so as not to lose the gift if we could help it. We had no trouble setting the gift down on the runway and then we dropped the cord. On the ground we ran to the spot. We found another feathered crown, a new one, freshly made, and attached to it a little hank of hand-spun cotton string. It was all attached to our drop line with a square knot. That night Ed noted in his diary, it is time we were getting closer to them on the ground. To Jim he wrote, I've been giving the trip some thought, and I feel this way, we should set a definite limit on the number of days we will wait on the Carare for them, and if they don't show, we should be ready to go into them. For myself, I am definitely ready to go in and feel that it would be reasonably safe, if we can ever use that term in our initial ground contact with these people. We should go in, one, wearing the headdresses, two, carrying small airplanes such as I have hanging here, three, carrying gifts wrapped as we have been wrapping them, four, shouting bidi midi punamupa, I like you, or other phrases that we are making familiar from the plane. God being with us, and up to this point we have every confidence that he is, I think this would put us in. The whole project is moving faster than we had originally dared to hope, and while I'm not forgetting ahead of God, I feel that we shouldn't lag. On December 10, Nate's journal continues with an account of the next visit. In spite of our evasive maneuver Ed's Indians tell him that they were down the Karare last week and saw us go by, they say, what a sense of humor! that they stripped off their clothes when they heard us coming and got sticks like lances so that we would think they were neighbors. They probably thought that we would drop them gifts. 
During the week, in talks with the members of the team it was decided that January 2nd would be the tentative date for the entry attempt. We were thinking in terms of going down with Indians, setting up a house, and then having the Indians retire while the team would wait for a contact. Then with the plane we would try to get the neighbors to come over and pay a visit. We know how to say, come to my house, and also, karare, in their tongue. And I feel confident that by repeated circling right over the ridge from them we can use curiosity to bring them over to the big river. Roughly, the strategy calls for the carrying of arms only by missionary personnel, and that out of sight. We presume that the first shot fired signals the failure of the entire project and the scuttling of any hope in the near future. Therefore, utmost care will be taken and the guns will be used only to frighten the savages in case of need of self-defense. There were two views or two possibilities under consideration, one, set up a little house at Palm Beach, the name agreed upon to designate the river beach chosen for landing the plane, and then retire until the neighbors would have had time to visit the site, and go back later, or, two, set up and attempt to make contact on that first trip. Since the events of this morning further affect this decision, I'll leave further discussion of it till later. This morning we took off from Centerville, Arajuno, at about 9.15, armed with gift-wrapped machetes, axes, and small knives, and plastic items. We also had three pairs of one-pound paper packages of paint pigment powder in three bright colors. These were for measuring playa sites that might serve for Palm Beach. Yesterday we ran tests here at Shell and found that when flying at 65 miles per hour, we could drop little bags of flour at seven-second intervals and pretty consistently mark off from 190 to 210 yards. This measure was taken in view of the impossibility of satisfactorily estimating the length of sandbars where there is nothing that would serve as a basis of comparison. We took a route down the Nishino, inasmuch as some of the Indians from Ed Station were down on the Karare River fishing again this week. We gradually eased over to the south and picked up the Karare in the area where we hoped to find a good site for Palm Beach. It wasn't long before we located a possibility. Most of the larger playas are on bends, and therefore of no value without having approaches cut first. The river is so serpentine that there are few possibilities of a sandbar along a straight stretch. We dragged, flew low over, the first. It seemed reasonable. The only drawback was that this beach would require takeoffs, with the prevailing wind, a serious difficulty. Nevertheless, after dragging it a time or two we bombed it with pigment and found that it had about 200 yards usable. Another difficulty was a big dead tree lying on the sand which forced the landing area very close to the riverbank foliage. The next one we found was about a mile or less downstream. It looked better, better approaches, especially into the prevailing wind. The approach would be steep but possible. The playa is low to the water so that a flood would easily cover it, but it is pebbly and firm-looking. We bombed it and found a conservative 200 yards, usable. I should not be surprised if a measure would show it to be more like 230 yards usable. Also, it is such that an overshot landing would only put us into shallow water. We dragged it once, keeping good airspeed until more familiar with the pullout area. In the pull out the trees along the banks overhang enough that it is a little squeaky, but by tipping over two trees after we land, we can take care of that problem. It began to look as if this would be our Palm Beach. We decided to shoot a simulated landing on it. Down close to it I could see the surface well, and I put the wheels down lightly twice as we accelerated again for the pull up. The surface was smooth as a gravel runway, and seemed hard. It is really ideal, except for vulnerability to flooding. This finding brings into focus the possibility of landing the team right there with a prefabricated treehouse and aluminum for a roof. It would mean that no Indians need to be in on the deal at all, and barring flood it would mean that I'd be able to fly them all out following a contact or whenever they should be ready to come. The picture would be something like this, one, on a Friday morning, Lord willing, free fall supplies and equipment onto the Palm Beach site from very low, just off the runway so as to be sure they would not be in the landing area. 2. We land with Jim and Roger, keeping the plane very light. 3. We land with Ed and Aluminum. 4. We land with Pete and more supplies, if Pete should feel led to go. On arrival, Jim and Roger would go to work tipping over the two or three medium to small trees in the approach. 
Then they would pick out a suitable tree for mounting the prefab tree house and start clearing around it. When the others are with them, all would go downstream to the first bend and tip over at least one of the two trees on opposite banks which make the pass rather narrow. This is not an absolute must, but would be highly desirable. During this part of the operation someone should always have a hand on a weapon inside a bag so that it could be fired on a moment's notice, and thus upset the equilibrium of any possible lancer. Next, back to the sandbar, with two men widening the clearing at the foot of the tree while two work on getting the tree house up in place and the aluminum roof on. Once the house is all set, the men would rotate on the clearing, perhaps with one fellow still concentrating on getting food supplies, stove, water, etc., up onto the platform. One man, resting from the clearing crew, could sit on the platform and cover the men on the ground, always keeping arms strictly out of sight. By evening, there ought to be a fair-sized clearing at the base of the tree, connected, by clearing, to the playa. The plane returns to Arajuno after checking radio set up in the treehouse, etc. Next day the plane begins the invitation of the neighbors to the Palm Beach site, both by calling phrases as well as by coaxing, circling in that direction from where they are, and then landing at Palm Beach and repeating every hour or so until we're sure they've caught on. Another detail will be the installation of a good-sized model plane on the site. Maybe five days would be committed to the effort. If unsuccessful we would withdraw, either by air or by sending a crew of Indians downriver in canoes. Supplies in the treehouse should be sufficient for two weeks to cover possible loss of the playa by flood or siege, the two rougher possibilities to be faced. The practicability of a raft, composed of air mattresses and bamboo should be reckoned with as a downstream exit to an army base on the Curare, in case the Indians should refuse to go to the rescue. Back to the narrative, we checked course and distance from the Palm Beach possibility to Terminal City 135 degrees and 3 minutes at 90 miles per hour. That makes about 4 and 1 half miles from the beach on the Curare to the Aka village. While letting down we headed east to the old man's house. The old boy wasn't there, but a young man was waving something like bark cloth and clearly offering it for trade. In the course of four passes we dropped, I think, a small knife, plastic cup, and possibly some article of clothing, not sure of the latter. Next we moved up to the clearing on the hill above the airplane house, or number three. There were two women there. We dropped a small knife. The head man was down by the house on his platform directing traffic. He had on a red and black checkered shirt we dropped last week. We signaled and shouted to him, indicating that we wanted him to come up to the hilltop. While we circled some more he disappeared from the platform and two younger boys took up his post. Next we made a low pass to drop an axe head beyond the platform. We must have scared the younger fellows, because one of them had a lance in his hand as we circled back. That was an unkind gesture, and we swooped down low again, to see if they would show any hostility. Someone must have given them the word because the lance had disappeared and all seemed well. Now we spotted the boss man in the checkered shirt up on the hill. We couldn't afford to slight him so we made two passes, and on the second dropped him a pair of pants which he caught in midair. These fellows will be dressed like dudes before we get to see them on the ground. Next, up to number four and the main act. The big shots, four of them, were clad in white t-shirts. Youngsters and women were in the older uniform. The trees that we had tried to get them to cut down by tossing stuff into them, were now cut down. Also, the walls, Kanta, were off the house. I failed to mention that they were also off No. 3, and beside the house, they had built a new and higher platform, like number 3's. We made a couple of low passes, calling to them, I like you, I like you, etc. On the last low pass, we tossed them a machete. While passing low we saw one of the four big wheels holding up a package, roundish and brown. We figured this was our trade item. We pulled up and climbed slowly. Ed was feeling pretty rough. It has been an unusually strenuous workout and Ed had had to attend to a sick baby across the river from his place earlier in the morning. He hadn't been feeling too sharp then. I was also feeling as though I'd been dragged through a keyhole, but it was worth it. At 3,000 feet I throttled all the way back, pulled flaps, and settled into the quiet of a 45-mile-per-hour glide while Ed got the gift overboard on the line. 
This week we gave them a couple of little bundles of string, a few smaller items, and four six-by-nine-inch portraits of the team members, tinted and bearing the insignia of the operation, a drawing of the little yellow airplane. These were glue-mounted on masonite board, when this stuff got down over by the trees, they got it and quickly took it out to the center of the clearing. They went into a 100% huddle over the contents of the white cloth mail sack that carried the mentioned items, except for the fellow who was busy fastening on their gift to us. I saw the gift leave him, drifting lazily. I rolled out of the turn and added power. Within three or four seconds, the package was swished skyward from them and the last man joined the huddle over the pictures. What wouldn't we have given to see those boys studying at our pictures and see their reactions? We headed home at 65 miles per hour with the prize dangling at the end of the line. At Arajuno, we set it down at the edge of the strip, cut the line and landed. On the ground, I bashed my way through the brush at the edge of the strip while Ed lost his breakfast. This is the first time I beat him to the prize. His legs are at least a foot longer than mine. When I got to the bark cloth bag, it was moving. Since we had given them a chicken last week, I figured it would be a bird, but as I started to peek in a hole the thought of a snake crossed my mind. However, it was a nice parrot in a basket, covered with bark. It was well tied and was complete with a partially nibbled banana inside for the trip. I had lunch with Ed and Mary Lou and talked of the possibilities open to us by the finding of a beach we could land on. We praise God for this, another indication of his leading in care. We believe that in a short time we shall have the privilege of meeting these fellows with the story of the grace of God. Chapter 14 Anaka on the Path Friday a.m. Nate tapped out this opening on a borrowed typewriter in Arajuno, and continued, This morning in Shelmera, as I was dressing in the bedroom adjoining the office radio room, I heard Marge checking a message just received from Mary Lou McCulley, who was holding down. Arajuno alone, while Ed helped in a conference ministry at Puyupungu. Mary Lou said she had rather sound reason to believe that Akas were in the neighborhood. Two things flashed through my mind, first, the opportunity to make contact with them, then the danger that a shot by one of the local Indians would ruin all the efforts made up till now, and the consequent closing of the door that seems to be opening to us. While Marge got the message relayed to Ed down at Puyupungu, I was rolling the plane out of the hangar. Too much was at stake to hesitate. Also, the weather was threatening to sour to the north. The mission house at Puyupungu is about five minutes from the airstrip. I got to the airstrip about one minute before Ed. We returned to Shelmera immediately. Then while Johnny gassed the plane, Marge and Ruth got some cargo and vegetables ready. Ed loaded, and I got some equipment together for the special nature of the expedition. I found that the little blank pistol I had just bought in. Keto felt very nice in my pocket. It must be because I feel that it would surely break up an attack, yet I can feel confident of not accidentally hurting anyone with it. It also shoots tear gas cartridges, but as Ed notes, if there is an attack on and I get close enough to use tear gas. Well, the weather held okay until we got over the Arajuno headwater valleys. There, low ceilings pushed us down into the valley, and within five minutes of Arajuno, the clouds were on the mesas that lined the half-mile wide valley. I kept a weather eye on the valley behind, got a final look at the clear area beyond the edge of the overcast and weighed the alternatives. In case of trouble, I could spiral up to 5,000 and head southwest into the clear area five minutes away. I yowed the plane to check the turn and bank indicator, without which this maneuver would be impossible. It was okay, light rain, heavier in patches, made us circle a time or two to get a good look ahead. We slipped across the ridge and down the other valley. In about another minute, these are the long kind of minutes that seem to last about five minutes each, we had the strip under us. We kind of figured the Akas might have wanted to take a look at the plane on the ground, and, not having found it at Arajuno, they might have headed for home. We then circled several times to let the neighbors know we'd come to welcome them. We landed around 8.30. As the bad weather moved southwest it became apparent that if we had delayed five or ten minutes we would have been too late. Walking from the strip to the house we wondered if we were being watched. Ed went ahead with both hands full. 
If they are looking for large stakes on long bone, they passed it up this time. I had one hand in my pocket nonchalantly flipping the safety on and off on my blank pistol, all the while wondering how far things should go before allowing a shot to signal the end of the whole operation. Again, we felt the need of God's guidance and intervention in a special way. As we neared the house, we heard a Christmas carol in Quechua. Ed explained that Mary Lou was rehearsing the local Indians for a Christmas program. When we got in the house, Ed took over for a few minutes and gave the locals a pep talk on how to win friends and influence people, also exhorting the Indians regarding our Christian obligations to reach the Akas with the gospel. It would seem that at this point the measure of missionary zeal among these new converts would depend pretty much on who saw whom first and under what circumstances. The rehearsal for the Christmas program proceeded rather anemically a few minutes longer and was then dismissed. Ed politely asked the Indians to hit the road for home. But they hung around. Finally, Ed offered them candy if they'd go. They agreed. He gave the two leaders some special candy for extra bravery. When we were finally alone, Ed ambled into the living room like the friendly local patrolman and said to Mary Lou, Now get a hold of yourself, lady. Everything's going to be okay. All we want are the facts. The capacity of these guys to toss something like this into a serious situation is a great asset. It kind of double clutches you into second gear when you've been pulling too hard and high. It seems that at 5.40 a.m., for men, the Indian who has been sleeping in the schoolhouse to help guard while Ed is away, went down the path toward the chakra to take care of the exigencies of nature, when about as far as the pole that holds the model plane aloft, he spotted a man at the end of the path naked, with lance, and with hair tied up in a bun on the back of his head. As they saw each other, the Aka ran into the forest. At 5.40 and 10 seconds past, Fermin was calling at Mary Lou's window. Fortunately his gun, in the schoolroom, was not loaded and he needed powder and shot. Of course Mary Lou would not give him any. He was sure she had gone mad and proceeded to try to convince her with sound advice on how to take care of Akka's. He was genuinely pale and excited, it looked like the real thing. First Mary Lou took the empty gun from the poor fellow. Then, although she is seven months pregnant, Mary Lou took a machete for a gift and headed down the path calling Beedi Midi Punamupa. I like you. I like you. In between her calls she could hear Fermin calling after her in Quechua. You're crazy. You're crazy. They'll kill you first. When she was two-thirds the way to the spot where the savage had been seen, for men, and Carmela, the Indian girl who lives with Mary Lou, to help in the house, both came running and caught up just in time for them all three to see a fresh wet footprint on a dry board across a little ditch. The print was headed toward the house. Across the path, they found grass recently stepped on, leading to the forest. Mary Lou then tossed the machete on the fresh path, called out some more and returned to the house. Half an hour later, when the local witch doctor arrived for school, he accompanied Mary Lou to the spot. Finding no further indication of visitors, Mary Lou picked up the machete and they came back to the house. Carmela expressed a common feeling when she said she would have suspected that Fermin imagined seeing an Aka until she saw the footprint. When Mary Lou asked her if she was afraid she said she was only a little afraid and that she was sure God would take care of them. Then Mary Lou heard Fermin call into Carmela and ask if the senora was scared. Carmela answered that as far as she could tell, she wasn't, to which Fermin answered that she would be when night came and he wasn't there to protect them. Mary Lou then asked him if he was going to stay that night. I will stay, he said, if I have a loaded gun. Without a gun, we will all be killed. We talked things over while Ed prepared a machete and a pot the way we do when we deliver them at the neighborhood. At 10.30, still raining lightly, we paraded down the airstrip decked out in the feather headdresses they have given us on the line and calling in Aka phrases while waving the gifts over our heads. We must have looked like a couple of Don Quixotes in the role of Santa Claus, delivering goodies to the trees. At 2.30 p.m., we made another safari down to the far end of the airstrip, making our most unusual offer. Then we decided that evening would be the most probable time to contact them here so we'd fly down to the neighborhood, count heads, and do tomorrow's drop today. We got ready and off, arriving over Palm Beach at 3.30.
spent about ten minutes there rechecking the beach. Dye and bandage material still on the sand, although nearby Playa seemed to have been underwater at some time since last week's visit. We rolled the wheels of the plane on the beach about 75 yards and then poured on the coal. The approach is really difficult, but the pullout is good except for one narrow place, but that is a good way downstream. The whole site had a friendly look to us this time. We checked trees along the beach that might be suitable for the treehouse and then took the three-minute trip over to the neighborhood. We found our friends scattered, with no waiting traffic manager making us think that maybe indeed we had gotten them on a seven-day week by the regularity of previous visits. We made a couple of low passes over the old man's house, taking movies in slow motion. One person showed up holding the same piece of material as last week. We dropped nothing. At the airplane house, we found about four people around the house and platform and three up on the cleared hill. The fellow on the hilltop had on the red swimming trunks an earlier gift. We dropped him a small knife with appropriate ribbons and hurried on to the main house, since by now we were convinced that men were clearly missing, making it probable that the visit at Arajuno was indeed real. We made a couple of low passes taking movies and then pulled up and let out a pot on the line. The contents of the pot this week were little packages of food wrapped in banana leaves, beef, chocolate, manioc, cookies, candy, and some beads. They received these gifts and helped themselves to about 20 to 50 yards of line and tied on a gift. It was larger and heavier than any so far. We made tracks for Arajuno with it. We let it down, cut the line, landed, and hid out through the brush, trusting that any intelligent snake would know enough to get out of our way. There's anti-venom in the plane. The gift was a large black bird, apparently their chicken in a basket cage reinforced with netting and a piece of bark cloth. We still haven't decided what to do with the bird. Also in the cage, there was a spinner's distaff loaded with cotton yarn, a well-received gift. Evening and night in Arajuno. Chapter 15 Why did the men go? The time was ripening fast. The men and the other wives and I spent long hours discussing this project of which we had dreamed for so many months and years. Olive Fleming remembered what she had read in Pete's diary of his willingness to give his life for the Akas. I reminded Jim of what we both knew it might mean if he went. Well, if that's the way God wants it to be, was his calm reply. I'm ready to die for the salvation of the Akas. While still a student in college Jim had written. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Mary Lou McCulley said, I hope no one feels any pressure is being put on Ed to go. This is a thing for each couple to face by themselves. Two gift flights remained before the actual ground operation was to begin. On December 23, when the Elliots and Flemings had gone to Arajuno to spend Christmas with the McCulleys, Nate flew Jim over the Aka settlement. Seeing the same old man they had noticed before standing in a clearing, they swooped down past him at no more than fifty feet. Wow, said Jim, that guy scared stiff. Nate agreed. It's as though they had steeled themselves against doing anything that would express either fear or hostility, he wrote later. Possibly afraid that they might scare away the chicken that lays the golden eggs. But their eyes don't lie, they're full of terror. Understandable, though. The expression is that of a six-year-old in the front row when the circus clown points a big gun right in his face. He's sure it's all in fun, but oh, brother, at the main house the chief traffic director was in full uniform, shirt and pants, everyone else more typically dressed, or undressed. Jim counted thirteen on hand. On our first swoop past, one of them held up what was apparently to be our gift. We dropped them a carrying net containing white cloth, a flashlight, a pair of pants, and other trinkets. What wouldn't we give to see them trying to make sense out of that flashlight? Jim announced the takeoff of their gift on the line, and I rolled out of the turn to hold it up. It is the heaviest yet. We cruised at 65 back to Arajuno and let the bark cloth bundle down hard. It hid in some bushes about 20 yards from Ed's house. Contents Cooked fish Two or three little packets of peanuts, a couple of pieces of cooked manioc, a cooked plantain. 
Two squirrels, very apparently killed by the hard fall, one parrot, alive, but a bit nervous. Two bananas in with the parrot. Two pieces of pottery, clay, busted to bits in the fall, a piece of cooked meat, and a smoked monkey tail. This is by far the most all-out effort at a fair trade arrangement on the part of the neighbors. We are all delighted. Jim and Ed sampled the meat, and we all ate some of the peanuts. Then, meaning no ill to the kind folks who mailed all those goodies to us, we sat down and ate the meal that Mary Lou had prepared. Even though Pete had not yet made his final decision, he and Olive with three other couples who would be directly involved in the project were together on the 23rd for discussion. Roger and Barbara Uderian still were on their station in the southern jungle. The wives were particularly concerned to know exactly what provisions were to be made for safety. It was decided that arms would be carried, concealed, and that if the situation appeared to be getting delicate, they would be shown, simply to let the Akas know that the white man held the upper hand. If this were not enough, shots would be fired with the intention only of scaring them. Roger had drawn up a plan of operation. Jim was assigned to the task of prefabricating a house to put up in a tree. This would ensure safety at night, especially if a gasoline pressure lamp were kept burning to illumine the area at the foot of the tree. Ed was responsible for collecting items for trade with the Akas. Raj would make up the first aid kit, Nate saw to the communications and transportation, Jim took charge of arms and ammunition, and when later on Pete decided that he would go too, he was to be responsible for helping Nate on the flights to and from Arajuno for flights over the Aka houses when he would shout over the loudspeaker, and for keeping supplies on the beach. Raj prepared a set of code signs to be drawn in the sand on the beach in case of emergency, and drew maps for each man with the code names he had made up for the strategic points. The language material which Jim and I had gathered in previous weeks was organized and memorized by each member of the party. Marge's place was to be at the radio in Shell Mara, standing by at all times when the plane was flying and keeping set schedules of contact with the men on the ground. It was decided that Barbara would stay in Arajuno, helping Mary Lou with the preparation of food, which Nate was to fly daily to Palm Beach. The appearance of the Aka at Arajuno, the fact that the Kichuas were guessing a little too shrewdly for comfort, the great encouragement in the drop flights, indeed, even the weather itself, seemed to be catapulting them toward their D-Day with now-or-never exigency. Within a month, the rainy season would start, flooding the rivers and making landings impossible. The ideal time for establishment of their beachhead in Aka territory would be early January, during the full of the moon. They set the date for Tuesday, January 3, 1956. Christmas at Arajuno was made as much like Christmas at home as Mary Lou's genius could make it. She even had a little Christmas tree, made of bamboo, and decorated with lights and tinsel. Ed and Jim, who already had reserved seats for the trip to Palm Beach, were keyed up. Pete was still waiting on God in prayer, before making his final decision to go. The other wives and I talked together one night about the possibility of becoming widows. What would we do? God gave us peace of heart, and confidence that whatever might happen, His word would hold. We knew that, when He putteth forth His sheep, He goeth before them. God's leading was unmistakable up to this point. Each of us knew when we married our husbands that there would never be any question about who came first, God and his work held first place in each life. It was the condition of true discipleship, it became devastatingly meaningful now. It was a time for soul-searching, a time for counting the possible cost. Was it the thrill of adventure that drew our husbands on? No. Their letters and journals make it abundantly clear that these men did not go out as some men go out to shoot a lion or climb a mountain. Their compulsion was from a different source. Each had made a personal transaction with God, recognizing that he belonged to God, first of all by creation, and secondly by redemption through the death of his Son, Jesus Christ. This double claim on his life settled once and for all the question of allegiance. It was not a matter of striving to follow the example of a great teacher. To conform to the perfect life of Jesus was impossible for a human being. To these men, Jesus Christ was God, and had actually taken upon himself human form, in order that he might die, and, by his death, provide not only escape from the punishment which their sin merited, but also a new kind of life, eternal both in length and in quality. This meant simply that Christ was to be obeyed, 
and more than that, that he would provide the power to obey. The point of decision had been reached. God's command, go ye, and preach the gospel, to every creature, was the categorical imperative. The question of personal safety was wholly irrelevant. On Sunday afternoon, December 18, Nate Saint sat at his typewriter to tell the world why they were going, just in case. In speaking these words he spoke for all, as we weigh the future and seek the will of God, does it seem right that we should hazard our lives for just a few savages? As we ask ourselves this question, we realize that it is not the call of the needy thousands, rather it is the simple intimation of the prophetic word that there shall be some from every tribe in his presence in the last day, and in our hearts we feel that it is pleasing to him that we should interest ourselves in making an opening into the Aka prison for Christ. As we have a high old time this Christmas, may we who know Christ hear the cry of the damned as they hurtle headlong into the Christless night without ever a chance. May we be moved with compassion as our Lord was. May we shed tears of repentance for these we have failed to bring out of darkness. Beyond the smiling scenes of Bethlehem may we see the crushing agony of Golgotha. May God give us a new vision of His will concerning the lost and our responsibility. Would that we could comprehend the lot of these Stone Age people who live in mortal fear of ambush on the jungle trail. Those to whom the bark of a gun means sudden, mysterious death. Those who think all men in all the world are killers like themselves. If God would grant us the vision, the word sacrifice would disappear from our lips and thoughts, we would hate the things that seem now so dear to us. Our lives would suddenly be too short, we would despise time robbing distractions, and charge the enemy with all our energies in the name of Christ. May God help us to judge ourselves by the eternities that separate the Akas from a comprehension of Christmas and Him, who, though He was rich, yet for our sakes became poor so that we might, through His poverty, be made rich. Lord, God, speak to my own heart and give me to know Thy holy will and the joy of walking in it. Amen. Chapter 16 We Go Not Forth Alone New Year's Day, 1956, saw Ed and his family, and Pete and Olive Fleming, in Shandia with Jim and me, while Roger and Barbara Udirian stayed in the McCulley house in Arajuno, to be on hand in case the neighbors came calling. Nate was completing his preparations for the very serious task of transporting the missionaries and their equipment to the beachhead. Monday morning, January 2nd, was a clear day for flying. By this time, Pete had decided to go so Nate had planned to get Pete and Olive and the McCulley's back to Arajuno from Shandia that day, and to shuttle Jim over on Tuesday. But on the morning radio contact he said, Think you better get ready to go to Arajuno today, Jim. We need time tonight for plans, and ought to take advantage of the good weather. Jim began throwing his things into an Indian carrying net while the McCulley's and Fleming's were flown over to Arajuno. Everything he could think of that might help or amuse the Akas, should they pay the men a visit, Jim put into the bag, harmonica, snakebite kit, flashlight, viewmaster with picture reels, yo-yo, and, above all, the precious notebook of Akka language material, with the carefully arranged morphology file. I helped. Jim get his things together, wondering all the while, will this be the last time I'll help him pack? Will this be the last lunch he'll eat in Shandia? When the little plane returned, circling over the airstrip, preparing to land to pick up Jim, his baggage, and the last few pieces of the prefabricated tree house he had made, we went together out the front door. Jim did not look back. At the strip he kissed me goodbye, and the plane was off. That night in Arajuno, the five men made a tentative schedule of timing for the next day's landing on Palm Beach in order to see whether the whole setup on the beach could be ready by evening. No detail was omitted, lists of equipment for each flight were made, and copies distributed among members. After supper and schedule conference, the stuff was laid out. The place began to look like a full-scale beachhead as each man checked and completed his equipment lists. When they turned in, sleep did not come easily for Nate, on whom rested the greatest burden of responsibility. He was spending the night at Arajuno in order to save time in the morning. His diary tells of that night. I drowsed off quite soon, but was checking the luminous face of my watch dial at 12.30, again at 2 o'clock, and from then on I was on horizontal listening post guard duty. I prayed, tried repeating verses from memory, and even counting. 
My entire share in this business seemed to hinge on that first takeoff and landing. Then, too, I had told the fellows that I would only take one in alone on the first trip. That meant a lonely vigil for someone. Raj was ruled out, because he spoke only Javaro. Ed had already beat Jim, by pulling straws, but Jim held out, claiming to be lighter. When I said a difference of 15 pounds would be decisive, they dragged out the bathroom scales. Ed was only 7 pounds heavier than Jim. Why, you cotton picker, said Jim. You've lost weight. Nate continued in his diary, if I should misjudge, Ed, and I would really be in a fix. If the plane were damaged, it would mean vulnerability in a flood, possibly even dismantling it and making a strip on higher ground, all this in a forest inhabited by Akas. We had faced it in the light of past tests and decided to go ahead. As I slept, or tried, it was still a rough decision. But there was no doubt in my mind that we should forge ahead. The stakes warranted it. The last time I punched in was 4 a.m. From 4 until movement in the house woke me at 5.45, I slept. The morning of January 3rd dawned clear. Somehow Nate found time later to record the events of that day, the day of the first landing in Aka territory. Raj and I got right out to the plane. We'd been losing fluid out of the right brake. With a 10cc syringe and number 22 hypodermic needle, we sucked brake fluid out of the left master cylinder and injected it into the right. No soap. Not enough. We'd lost too much when I fixed the brake fitting the night before. The others were hauling boards and equipment and aluminum to the strip and arranging all in order of priority. At the 7 a.m. radio contact we asked Marge to ask Johnny to bring us brake fluid as quickly as possible. Also, Olive had had a rough night, sick, and planned to go back to Shell with Johnny. This delay gave us a peaceful breakfast and time for prayer together. At the close of their prayers the five men sang one of their favorite hymns, We Rest on Thee, to the stirring tune of Finlandia. Jim and Ed had sung this hymn since college days and knew the verses by heart. On the last verse, their voices rang out with deep conviction. We rest on thee, our shield and our defender, thine is the battle. Thine shall be the praise. When passing through the gates of pearly splendor victors, we rest with thee through endless days. Nate's terse account continues, it was a beautiful day. Chiggers kept us scratching, but spirits were all high. Johnny hove in sight at 740. We decided he should stand by till we'd see how the first landing turned out. Ed and I got airborne at about 8.02 a.m. Curiously enough we had started the tentative schedule on paper at 8 a.m and when we got up over the first ridge we could see by the river fog over the Carare that we never could have made it earlier. The fog got uncomfortably thicker under us, but the holes allowed us to keep in touch with the river. The sun was shining, and we figured it better to wait, if necessary, for the right holes rather than turn back and make a later attempt. As we got within two minutes of the site, the fog thinned so that we could safely slip down under it and make an approach. We went in, simulating a real landing checked the full length for sticks and other hazards, and pulled up. I had planned three runs before landing, but the thing was exactly as we had seen it several times before. As we came in the second time we slipped down between the trees in a steep side slip. It felt good as we made the last turn and came to the sand, so I set it down. The right wheel hit within six feet of the water and the left ten feet later. As the weight settled on the wheels, I felt it was soft sand, too late to back out now. I hugged the stick back and waited. One softer spot and we'd have been on our nose, maybe our back. It never came. We jumped out, rejoicing in the deliverance. The relief at being past that hurdle without damage dampened my sensitivity to the glaring possibility that I might not be able to take off. It was great just to be there. We ran up and down the sand hunting the best course for a takeoff attempt and removing sticks that could puncture a tire. Then Ed took the movie camera to the far end while I taxied back toward a takeoff position. About thirty yards from the end I felt the right wheel sink, and my heart sank with it. I cut the engine and Ed came on the double. He lifted the low wing and I hoisted the tail around. Then using the engine, and with Ed listing the wing, we got out of the softer stuff and cut the engine. Again we searched for harder spots, 
Finally, we pushed the airplane backward into some bushes right at the edge of the beach. It meant losing 30 yards of the total 200 available, a critical loss in view of the generally soft consistency of the whole area. However, the plane had been lightened and we were now working only 1,000 feet above sea level, where we would get more lift out of the wing. As I got back into the plane, Ed went again to the far end of the beach. It shook me a little to think what Ed might record with that movie camera. After a final check, I let her go. The sand really grabbed the wheels, but the acceleration still seemed satisfactory, so I hung on and was airborne in about 130 yards, about 40 or 50 before being over the water, at about 30 miles per hour. I held it down close to the water to gain speed and then pulled up steeply out of that hardwood canyon, circled back, saluted Ed, and beat a trail for Arajuno, not quite sure yet what I should do next. At least I knew now what I was in for. At Arajuno, everyone was glad to see the plane back, but my story dampened the festive spirit appreciably. We scrapped the scheduled list for flight number two and took, instead, Jim and Raj and such basic equipment as was absolutely essential, like the walkie-talkie and a little more food. The men gave me more ballast aft. If anything went wrong, if we nosed over in the landing, there would be four of us at least. Johnny continues to stand by now. He suggested softening the tires to keep them up in the sand. It never occurred to me, but having taken them down to about 12 pounds each, I felt much better. We took off three minutes behind schedule. The fog was almost gone. We circled once, checked safety harness, and slipped down between the trees. The soft tire stayed on top of the sand, much better, and the sun was drying things out. The meeting of the three musketeers was jubilant. They set to work clearing debris from the playa while I got the plane into position for takeoff just as I had done last time, same deal, cut over the water, and then up and out. Trip number three took in their radio and some tools and the first priority boards for the treehouse. Running about ten minutes behind schedule, I believe. The three fellows on the beach located a good tree, close to the open sand and slanted very slightly, in which they started to nail up the ladder and tree house. They hadn't figured on its being an ironwood tree, but that is what it proved to be, a wood which lives up to its name. Next flights brought in personal items, a larger radio, more food, and the last boards and aluminum. Later Nate recorded, now 25 minutes behind schedule, because I was spending time in unscheduled committee meetings on the beach. Working with safety belts, plagued by myriads of sweat bees and tiny gnats, the men managed to nail up the two platforms on which they were to sleep, with an aluminum roof overhead. With Nate's fifth flight completed, he headed for Terminal City, where he called out to the Akas over the public address system, come tomorrow to the Karare. The Indians showed puzzlement at hearing this message. Nate swung briefly back to Palm Beach and called to the fellows that he had given the message to the Akas. Then he flew to Arajuno to sleep. Next morning, Wednesday, January 4, Jim wrote me a letter. Just worked up a sweat on the hand crank of the radio. Nobody's reading us, but we read all the morning contacts clearly. We had a good night with a coffee and sandwich break at 2 a.m. didn't set a watch last night, as we really feel cozy and secure 35 feet off the ground in our little bunks. The beach is good for landings, but too soft for takeoffs. We have these three alternatives. 1. Wait for the sun to harden it up and sit until a stiff breeze makes a takeoff possible. 2. Go make a strip in Terminal City. 3. Walk out. We saw puma, jungle lion, tracks on the sand and heard them last night. It is a beautiful jungle, open and full of palms. Much hotter than Shandia. Sweat with just a net over me last night. Our hopes are up, but no signs of the neighbors yet. Perhaps today is the day the Akas will be reached. It was a fight getting this hut up, but it is sure worth it to be up off the ground. We're going down now. Pistols, gifts, novelties, and prayer in our hearts. All for now. Ed wrote to Mary Lou. Dearest baby. It is 1 p.m. and we've just finished dinner and Nate is taking off to see if he can spot the boys. We are waiting for them to show up. Meals are fine and plentiful. I'll send some dirty clothes back with Nate this evening. Bugs are bad. 
Here's a list of things we need. 1. Two air mattresses, we are sending plastic ones back. 2. The pricker for gasoline pressure stove. 3. Three shagra, Indian carrying nets, to hang up in our tree house, to put stuff in. 4. One empty milk can to put candy in. 5. Alcohol for pressure stove. 6. My sunglasses. 7. Insect repellent. 8. More milk and lemonade. 9. Old scraps of meat for fish bait. I love you very much. Give my love to the boys. Ed, thanks for everything. 10. Sun helmet, if around. On Wednesday morning Nate and Pete took off from Arajuno, flew over Terminal City, and noticed a definite thinning out of the crowd there. This encouraged them to think the boys were on their way to Palm Beach. Landing on the sand strip at Palm Beach, they found Ed, Raj, and Jim pacing the beach, holding out gifts and shouting welcome phrases to the trees. Nate set to work checking the radio and found the transmitter had not functioned because of a loose connection in the microphone. He was relieved to re-establish contact with Marge and Shelmera. Raj and Nate built a beach house, then went swimming while Ed and Jim sacked out in the tree house. The afternoon drowsed by, and as the tropical sun began to slide down behind the great forest trees, Nate once more elbowed the little plane out of the river valley, and he and Pete headed for Arajuno to spend another night. Thank God for the unusually evident blessing we have seen yesterday and today, Nate wrote in his diary. Thank God for a good team, and forbid that any man should fail to praise him. Again on Thursday, January 5th, Nate, with a driving sense of urgency, was writing of events as they happened. His account of the day's events, in the last week, was scrawled in pencil in a schoolboy's notebook, there was no typewriter on Palm Beach. All's quiet at Palm Beach. However, we feel sure we are being watched. On the way in this morning, Pete and I flew over Terminal City, two women and two children at Old Man's House. Airplane house is deserted. Probably women and children have gone up to Big House. Big House showed five or six women, several children and possibly one old man. While letting down for Palm Beach, we checked about a mile of playas below campsite. Saw several tracks probably of taper and other smaller stuff. On way up to campsite, we were down in riverbed thinking to salute the fellows and pull up and around to land when, just one bend below camp, we sighted footprints. We pulled up and doubled back for another look. They were unmistakable. We buzzed on up past camp, saluted, pulled up and around checking the two playas above camp, no soap, and landed. News of the footprints livened up the party considerably. Everyone had had a good night's sleep in the treehouse. At 9 p.m., strong wind swayed trees and made such sounds that woke up the three men. But all three were soon asleep again. They had a lighted lantern up there to keep the target well lit. At 5 a.m. they shined the flashlight down on the playa to check a gift machete left the night before. It was gone. For the next 15 minutes the jungles rang with Aka phrases perhaps with a Midwestern accent. They then shined the light for a closer look. A big leaf had fallen on the knife so as to hide it. Tough. As Pete and I pulled in here, Jim was out in the river fishing, almost in Aka uniform. Modesty seems a small consideration after seeing the dress of our neighbors. If our dress is any criterion, we're giving them everything. Pete's long-sleeved shirt, pants, and straw hat make him look like a beachcomber. Flies keep the rest of us pretty well clad in t-shirts, pants, and tennis shoes. Jim sits in the smoke from the fire when not fishing or standing in the middle of the river, preaching out of his notebook of phrases. Except for 47 billion flying insects of every sort, this place is a little paradise. With the help of smoke and repellent, we are all enjoying the experience immensely. A little while ago, Jim pulled in a 15-inch catfish. It is roasting over the fire now. Ed and Raj are up at the bend, clearing a bad group of trees out of the approach. It's pretty close dropping down through there, will be much better now. Pete is stirring. Getting interested in lunch. Just emptied a plastic bag of prepared raw vegetables into a pressure cooker already partly filled with meat chunks. He's gone up to the treehouse now for salt. The armor Raj made, breast and tummy plate, 
out of a gas drum worked very well for a stove. While getting steam up on the stew we tossed termite nests on the fire to chase the gnats like the Indians do. By the time the three musketeers got back the stew was done and everyone was ready to test it. It went down easily, flushed along by generous quantities of lukewarm lemonade. Ever since Pete and I landed and reported the human footprints among the taper and others, we were the objects of boisterous ridicule. However, curiosity brought on the acid test, and Jim and Raj started downstream, wading and running the beaches, to check up at close range. We agreed that if they didn't show up in an hour, we'd look for them from the air. Fifty minutes later, we saw them coming. I waited out to meet them and get the word, taper, they called. Then at closer range, Akas, at least thirty of them. Characters. Sure enough, there were footprints, an adult, a youngster, perhaps twelve years old, and a little tot, but the prints were maybe a week old. The mud they were stamped in was cracked from drying. Sixty miles per hour, or no, we had sure enough distinguished the prints from the many animal tracks. Among other tracks there were alligator, puma, taper, etc. We also saw some good-sized ducks. Someone said, too bad they're out of season. We banned firing guns for fear of frightening the Indians. When someone noted with humor that although in Ecuador, we weren't speaking any Spanish, the response was, no one else around here does either. We had all discovered the benefits of lolling in the shallow water nine-tenths submerged, and since I had just finished with the 2 p.m. contact, I shed my clothes and raced the gnats to the water taking the sun helmet along. The fellows thought it a regal sight, nothing but a helmet and two bare feet sticking out of the water, so they dug out a couple of cameras. We enhanced some of the shots by adding Time magazine to the hydraulic siesta. Jim then started reading us a novel. We roared over even remotely funny suggestions and finally skipped to the end to see who married whom and set it aside in favor of some readings from Time magazine. One indulgent description really rolled us, he looked like a tenement Tom starting his ninth life in the garbage can circuit. At 3 p.m. I went aloft and circled up to 6,000 feet, where I could see the Aka clearing and Palm Beach at the same time. And then I glided down slowly, pausing now, and then to circle tightly at full throttle so that anyone could hear me and judge the direction from the sound. As I approached to land I thought I saw fresh human tracks, just two bends upstream, from camp. They were among old taper tracks, couldn't arouse any enthusiasm over it at camp. I was about fresh out of enthusiasm too, for everything. By 4.30 everyone felt that the Akas had not yet found our location, yet everyone was determined to sweat it out till they should locate us and show themselves. One thing sure is that if we are faggy just waiting on the beach, the Akas are really going to lose their zip by the time they locate us after tramping two or three days through the jungle. Pete and I were ready to take off for Arajuno at 4.45. The air was dead. We left all unnecessary weight behind. As we started slogging down through the soft sand on the takeoff run, we weren't doing it all well. At about the halfway point I cut the throttle and we stopped in about 30 yards. It looked like Pete might help guard the treehouse for the night, but we plowed back to take off position for one more try. Raj talked us into shutting the engine off and pushing the plane by hand just as far back as we possibly could. The tailwheel was just a few feet from the water. Then Jim went down to the windsock to give signals and with Ed and Raj pushing the wing struts we started out. This time we made it okay and made a beeline for Terminal City. We circled the main house twice, repeating the words, Karariapa, River. Engine skipped a beat over Terminal City, spark plug trouble. A man was on the platform kneeling toward the direction of the campsite and pointing with both hands. This really gave us a boost. We hurried back and glided down over camp, shouting the news. They signaled OK and we hit for home. At Arajuno, we circled a couple of times, shouting a welcome to anyone who might be in the bush, then landed. After landing, Pete and I walked the airstrip with a gift machete, no soap. We find we have a friendlier feeling for these fellows all the time. We must not let that lead us to carelessness. It is no small thing to try to bridge between 20th century and the Stone Age. God help us to take care. Everyone is in bed and asleep here now. So it is left to me to go down the path and shut off the diesel. 
My little blank revolver is a welcome companion on such a venture. But safety is of the Lord. May we see them soon. Night. Chapter 17 Success on Friday About eleven o'clock Friday morning, January 6, Nate and Pete sat in the small cooking shelter they had built on the sand. Ed was at the upper end of the beach, Raj in the center, Jim at the lower end, continuing their verbal bombardments of the jungle. At 11.15, their hearts jumped when a clear masculine voice boomed out from across the river answering Ed's call. Immediately, three Aukas stepped out into the open. They were a young man and two women, one about thirty years of age, the other a girl of about sixteen, naked except for strings tied about the waist, wrists, and thighs, and large wooden plugs and distended ear lobes. The missionaries, temporarily struck dumb by the surprise appearance, finally managed to shout simultaneously, in Aka, Puanani. Welcome. The Aka man replied with a verbal flood, pointing frequently to the girl. His language was unintelligible, but his gestures were plain. He's offering her for trade, exclaimed Pete, or maybe as a gift. When it seemed that the Akas wanted someone to come across, Jim peeled to his shorts and began wading over to them. The others cautioned him to go slow. Jim hesitated and the Akas were slightly hesitant, but as Jim gradually approached, the girl edged toward the water and stepped off a log. The man and the other woman followed shortly. Jim seized their hands and led them across. With broad smiles, many punanis, and much reference to their phrase books, the five conveyed the idea that their visitors had come well and need not be afraid. The Aka's uneasiness fell from them, and they began jabbering happily to themselves and to the men, seemingly with little idea that we didn't understand them. Raj brought out some paring knives, which they accepted with cries of delight. Nate presented them with a machete and model airplane. The others, suddenly remembering the guns in the cook shack and tree house, went back to hide the weapons beneath their duffel. They dug out cameras and shot dozens of photos, while the women looked through a copy of Time magazine, and the man was being doused with insecticide to demonstrate civilization's way of dealing with the swarming pests. The group spontaneously began referring to him as George. Presently the girl, the man called her Delilah, drifted over toward the piper, rubbing her body against the fabric, and imitating with her hands the plane's movement. She seemed dreamy, wrote Pete, while the man was natural and self-possessed, completely unafraid. They showed neither fear nor comprehension of the cameras. Pete continued, soon the fellow began to show interest in the plane and we guessed from his talk that he was willing to fly over the village to call his comrades. We put a shirt on him, it's cold up high, and he climbed into the plane with no sign of any emotion except eagerness to do his part. He acted out how he was going to call and repeated the words. Nate taxied down the strip and took off while George shouted all the way. After circling and shouting briefly Nate landed again thinking to give the fellow a rest before making the flight to his village. Nothing doing, he was ready to go right then. Up they went again, this time to Circle Terminal City. What must have been the thoughts of that primitive man as he peered down at the treetops and at the green sea below him, and suddenly recognized a familiar clearing, with familiar figures in it? George chortled with delight, and leaned out to wave and yell at his fellow villagers. The woman at the old man's house, wrote Nate, her jaw dropped on seeing George. Expression of delight on the face of the young man on the platform. Back on the sand strip, George leaped out, clapping his hands. The five men immediately gave thanks to God, with heads up to try to show their visitors that they were addressing their heavenly father. As Ezekiel said, the word was in my bones as a living fire and for these men the drive to deliver to the Akas the message of redemption through the blood of Jesus was blocked only by the language barrier. If only they might suddenly leap over the barrier and convey to the Indians one hint of the love of God. The missionaries demonstrated for their guests such modern marvels as rubber bands, balloons, and a yo-yo, served them lemonade and hamburgers with mustard, which they evidently enjoyed. Then they tried to get across the idea that an invitation to visit the Aka village would not be scorned. For this notion, George, displayed no enthusiasm. Why is it he's so reluctant, whenever we broach the subject, one of the five demanded. 
Another replied, maybe he lacks the authority to invite us on his own. At 4.15, Nate wrote, we decide to fly again. George decides to go along. We say, no, he puts his machete and envelope of valuables in the plane and looks at Pete as though he had already said it was okay and climbs in. On the way over, we finally get Marge on the radio. Great rejoicing. Back on Palm Beach we held a strategy meeting, talking of going over to Aka houses if a delegation of, say, six Akas arrive and seem happy to escort us. After that, every effort would be bent toward building an airstrip in their valley. The fellows tried to explain to George how an airstrip should be cleared in his village. At first, he did not understand their word for trees. When he finally got it, he corrected their pronunciation. They stuck sticks in the sand to represent trees. Then, with one of the model planes, Nate showed George how the airplane would crash and tumble among the trees. With the model lying on its back among the sticks in the sand, the fellows all shook their heads and moaned in evident distress. The scene was then reenacted, only this time the fellows took machetes and cut down all the trees, sticks, and smoothed the sand carefully. The model airplane approached for a smooth landing, accompanied by great rejoicing. As the day wore on, Delilah showed signs of impatience. Once when Jim Elliott left the group to climb up to the treehouse, she leaped up and followed. When he then turned and rejoined the others, she acted downcast. Later, as Nate and Pete got ready to return to Arajuno, George seemed to understand that he could not accompany them. Before the airplane took off the fellows carefully gathered all of the exposed film and everything that had been written to fly it out for safekeeping. If something unforeseen should happen, they did not want the record lost. When the Akas indicated that they might spend the night on the beach, the three musketeers hospitably offered them the small shack they had been using for cooking, motioning that it was theirs to occupy if they wished. Delilah, however, had other ideas. She wheeled and walked off down the beach. George called to her, but she kept going. He followed her into the forest. The older woman stayed by the fire, talking a blue streak, with Raj. She stayed on the beach most of the night. The next morning when Jim came down to start the fire, he found her gone, but the embers from her fire were still red. The events of the next day, Saturday, January 7, were anticlimactic. The men waited hopefully, expecting the Akas to arrive momentarily with an invitation to their village. But no one came. Around noon, Jim looked at his watch. Okay, boys, he said. I give them five minutes. If they don't show up, I'm going over. Wisdom prevented him from carrying out his threat, but he did go back into the forest on a rudimentary trail he had discovered behind the tree house, hoping to find some trace of them. He found the forest floor remarkably open and abounding in animal trails, but no human footprints. Nate and Pete then flew over Terminal City and were disheartened to find some signs of fear. On the first trip all of the women and children ran to hide. A few men in sight seemed relieved to hear Nate call, Come, come, come. He threw them a blanket and a pair of shorts to reassure them. On the second flight George appeared with a group of men. One old man pointed toward Palm Beach and seemed friendly but not exuberant. The third trip showed that fear had vanished. Nate reported, I got some good smiles from George and another young man who, one can imagine, probably aspires to ride in the plane. Ed wrote a note to Mary Lou that afternoon. Dearest baby. It's 4.30 and no sign of our visitors yet, but we believe they'll arrive, if not tonight, then early tomorrow. Thanks for the clothes and food again. We are certainly eating well. This has been a well-fed operation from start to end. We feel now that we ought to press going over there and get the airstrip in as fast as possible, but we'll have to wait and see how God leads us, and them, too. Looks like Pete will be there to help you tomorrow morning. Give Stevie and Mikey my love and tell them I'll see them soon, and Carmela too. All for now. All of my love, Ed tossing on his bunk that night at Arajuno, Nate wondered if everything possible had been done to interest the visitors and encourage them to return with their friends. Why had they been so casual? They seemed almost bored at times as he looked back on it. Jim's explanation had reassured him. That's Indian. If you landed him on the moon, he'd be satisfied in five minutes. 
As they climbed into the piper on Sunday morning, Pete called, So long, girls. Pray. I believe today's the day. At Palm Beach, the fellows enjoyed the ice cream and warm blueberry muffins, fresh from the oven, Mary Lou had sent along. All then agreed on a visit to Terminal City. This time Nate went alone. Circling over Terminal City, he found only a handful of women and children. This sent his spirits soaring. Undoubtedly the men were at last on their way to the Curare, and, sure enough, on the flight back, he spotted a group of men en route to Palm Beach. As he touched his wheels down, he shouted to the four, This is it, guys. They're on the way. A contact with Marge and Shelmera had been arranged for 12.30. Breathlessly and still using their code words, Nate told of spotting a commission of 10 on the way from Terminal City, adding, Looks like they'll be here for the early afternoon service. Pray for us. This is the day. We'll contact you next at 4.30. Chapter 18. Silence. At 4.30 sharp, Marge Saint eagerly switched on the radio receiver in Shelmera. This was the moment when the big news would come. Had the men been invited to follow the Akas, to their houses? What further developments would Nate be able to report? She looked at her watch again. Yes, it was at least 4.30. No sound from Palm Beach. She and Olive hunched, close to the radio. The atmosphere was not giving any interference. Perhaps Nate's watch had run a little slow. In Arajuno, Mary Lou and Barbara had their radio on, too. Silence. They waited a few minutes, then called Shelmera. Arajuno, calling Shelmera. Arajuno, standing by for Shelmera. Any word from Palm Beach, Marge? Over. Shelmera, standing by. No, no word as yet. We'll be standing by. Not a crackle broke the silence. Were the men so preoccupied with entertaining their visitors that they had forgotten the planned contact? Five minutes. Ten minutes. No, it was inconceivable that all five would forget. It was the first time since Nate had started jungle flying in 1948 that he and Marge had been out of contact even for an hour, but perhaps their radio was not functioning. It happened occasionally. The women clung to each little hope, refusing to entertain the thought of anything's really having gone wrong. Their suspense was the sharper because most of their missionary friends on the network were unaware that Operation Aka was in progress. In Arajuno, Barbara and Little Beth. Udirian had primped up a bit, since it had been planned that Raj would come to Arajuno that night, while Pete took a turn sleeping in the treehouse. Surely the little plane would come winging over the treetops before sundown. They walked up and down the airstrip, waiting. Just after sundown Art Johnston, one of the doctors with Hospital Bozandis, affiliated with the missionary radio station HCJB in Quito, came into the radio room in Shelmera. The radio was still on, but Marge sat with her head down on the desk. Is something the matter, Marge? She told him the situation briefly, but asked that he not divulge it yet. If nothing serious had actually happened, it would be disastrous to publicize what was taking place. There was little sleep that night, for any of the wives. By seven o'clock on the morning of Monday, January 9, 1956, Johnny Keenan, Nate's colleague in the MAF, was in the air flying toward the sand strip which Nate had earlier pointed out to him. As he flew, Marge called me in Shandia, we haven't heard from the fellow since yesterday noon. Would you stand by at ten o'clock for Johnny's report? It was the first I knew that anything was amiss. A verse God had impressed on my mind when I first arrived in Ecuador came back suddenly and sharply, When thou passeest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. I went upstairs, to continue teaching the Indian girls' literacy class, praying silently, Lord, let not the waters overflow. At about 9.30 Johnny's report came through. Marge related to me in Shandia. Johnny has found the plane on the beach. All the fabric is stripped off. There is no sign of the fellows. In Shelmera, a pilot of the Summer Institute of Linguistics, Larry Montgomery, who is also a reserve officer in the USAF, lost no time in contacting Lt. Gen. William K. Harrison, 
Commander-in-Chief of the Caribbean Command, which included the United States Air Rescue Service in Panama. Radio station HCJB was also informed and news flashed around the world, five men missing in AUCA. Territory By noon, all possible forces which might contribute to their rescue, including the prayers of thousands of people in all parts of the world, were set in motion. Barbara and Mary Lou were flown from Arajuno to Shelmera. They felt confident that there would be some survivors, and so left a note on the door of the house in Arajuno, stating where medicine and food could be found. What if one of them should stagger home wounded, or if all of them arrived back after a grueling trip in the jungle? Mary Lou decided that she must return, to be there to help them. Late Monday afternoon, she was flown home again, where she was to remain three more days. On Monday evening, it was decided that a ground search party should be organized, on the assumption that one or more of the men still lived, and Frank Drown, Roger Udirian's colleague, a man with twelve years of jungle experience among the Javaros, was unanimously elected to lead the party. Dr. Art Johnston offered to go along in his capacity as physician. Thirteen Ecuadorian soldiers promptly volunteered. The news put me in a cold sweat, said Frank, but I asked my wife, Marie, if she minded if I went. Of course you must go, was her reply, and Frank accepted without hesitation. On Tuesday morning I was flown out of Shandia with Nate's sister. Rachel, who had been with me while the men went on the Aka trip. Frank was brought out from Makuma, and many of the missionary men arrived in Shelmera from Quito, some as volunteers to go on the ground party. Word was received by a short wave that a helicopter was on its way from Panama, which lifted the spirits in Shelmera. That night, the pilot of an Ecuadorian airline came to the house to tell the wives that he had flown over the scene at about six o'clock in the evening, and saw, a short distance upstream, a large fire, without any smoke, which would indicate perhaps a gasoline fire or a signal fire. Nate always carried signal flares in his emergency kit. This was a ray of hope for the five wives, to sleep on that night. On Wednesday, Johnny Keenan took off again in MAF's second Piper cruiser a twin to Nate's plane, on his fourth flight over Palm Beach to see if there were any signs of life. Marge, who had hardly left the radio since. Sunday afternoon, stood by for his reports. Barbara, Olive, and I were upstairs. Suddenly, Marge called, Betty. Barbara. Olive. I raced down the stairs. Marge was standing with her head against the radio, her eyes closed. After a while she spoke, they found one body. A quarter mile downriver from the little denuded plane, Johnny had sighted a body, floating face down in the water, dressed in khaki pants and white t-shirt, the usual uniform of the men. Barbara felt it was not Roger, he had been wearing blue jeans. Some of the land party went over to Arajuno to prepare the airstrip for the big planes which would be arriving soon from Panama. Late on. Wednesday afternoon the roar of the plains was heard, and far on the western horizon, where the volcano Songhai stands, a smoking pyramid, the great plains were silhouetted. As they drew near and circled the strip, the red, white, and blue of the United States Air Force became visible. During the day the remaining volunteers who made up the ground party were transported to Arajuno where Indians, soldiers, and others of the missionaries were milling around the airstrip, waiting to start. In spite of the strain she was under, Mary Lou remained her efficient self, she had a meal ready for all the men before they headed downriver. There was some difficulty in securing Quechua carriers, they had long lived too close for comfort to the Akas and did not want to get any closer. However, their loyalty to the men who had worked among them overcame their hesitancy, and about 10.30 the party was ready to move off on foot, guns handy, eyes sharp. D. Short, a missionary from western Ecuador, who happened to be in Quito when news of the disaster arrived, had come to Arajuno. As the party left, Mary Lou turned to him and said with finality, there is no hope. All the men are dead. Probably most of the ground party would have agreed with her, but, nonetheless, every time they rounded a bend of the river they looked expectantly for one or more of the missing men. Back in Shelmera, the radio crackled again. Marge answered, Shelmera standing by. Johnny Keenan reported. Another body sighted, about 200 feet below Palm Beach. 
And once again, God, who had promised grace to help in time of need, was true to his word. None of us wives knew which two these bodies might prove to be, but we did know in whom we had believed. His grace was sufficient. At about four o'clock in the afternoon the ground party reached Oglin, an Indian settlement situated at the place where the Oglin River meets the Curare. Here camp was set up for the night. Frank Drown organized the group, appointing one man to hire canoes, one in charge of cargo, one to plan seating in the canoes, one as mess chief, two for safety precautions. That night they slept on beds of banana leaves. Watches were kept all night. Before the party set off on Thursday morning, the missionaries offered up prayer, committing themselves into the hands of God, and the Ecuadorian soldiers, of a different faith, prayed with them. The party moved cautiously down the Curare, the river was at its lowest, making navigation difficult, and special care was exercised in rounding the many bends, for it was feared Akas might be lying in wait. At about ten o'clock Johnny Keenan again flew over the ground party in the piper, and Frank Drown was able to make contact with him by means of a two-way radio which the air rescue service had supplied. Johnny told them of two canoes of Kichuas, proceeding upriver in the direction of the ground party, he feared that in their excitement some one of the men in the party might shoot at the first sight of an Indian on the river. Soon the two canoes of Kichuas appeared. They were a small group of Indians from McCulley's station at Arajuno. On their own initiative, they had boldly pressed into Aka territory ahead of anyone else, and had gone all the way to Palm Beach. The ground party was saddened when one of the Indians, a believer who had come to know Christ since Ed had gone to Arajuno, told them of having found Ed's body on the beach at the edge of the water. He had Ed's watch with him. Now the missionaries knew who one of their fallen colleagues was, but a chance remained that at least three others had survived. They pressed on. In the big house at Shell Mara, children played, babies were fed and bathed. The members of the rescue service came and went, Marge maintained contact on the short wave, meals were somehow cooked and served, visitors greeted and informed of the latest word, and prayer went up to God continually. The mechanics were making the final adjustment on the blades of the army helicopter, which had been dismantled and shipped from Panama in an Air Force cargo plane. My diary recounts the events of Thursday afternoon as the helicopter was dispatched to Palm Beach. Two o'clock, Johnny's Piper and helicopter headed for Arajuno. Also Navy R-4D, Captain McGee and Major Nurnberg in helicopter. Three o'clock, the aircraft are stacking up over the site of the incident now. I feel sick at my stomach. Three twenty, blessed is she that believed. The aircraft are circling the site. 3.30, yeah, in the way of thy judgment, O Lord, have we waited for thee. The desire of our soul is to thy name. 4 o'clock, still circling. Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him. As the wives hoped and prayed and waited the procession of flying machines moved slowly down toward Palm Beach, the airplane circling to keep pace with the slower helicopter skimming along at treetop level and following the bends of the river. The airplanes chose different altitudes to avoid danger of collision as pilots circled with eyes on the jungle below. Johnny Keenan in the Little Yellow Piper was lowest. A few hundred feet above were the U.S. Navy R-4D, the Navy version of the familiar DC-3, and higher, the big amphibian of the Air Rescue Service. Close by, Colonel Azurieta, in a plane of the Ecuadorian Air Force, flew in wider circles ready to help should decisions be needed. The teamwork of the United States. Army, Air Force, and Navy, and of the government and military services of Ecuador, was heartwarming to the wives. Air Force Major Nuremberg, riding in the Army helicopter, landed briefly to talk with the ground party, still some distance up the river from Palm Beach. Ed McCulley's name was mentioned guardedly on the radio. Those hearing guessed that somehow Ed's body had been identified. Was this one of the two bodies that had been seen from the air? Had three perhaps escaped into the jungle? Or been taken captive? After a few moments, the helicopter moved on. Finally, rounding a bend, it came at last to Palm Beach and landed. Nuremberg, carbine at the ready, jumped out and looked around. Anxious minutes went by. Back in the chopper he radioed, no one here. Hope flickered brighter in those who heard. The helicopter was off again and started slowly down the river. Crossing to the other side it stopped, hovering, 
the force of its downwashing disturbing the muddy surface of the water. Minutes later it moved on, only to stop again 200 yards farther on. A third and a fourth time, Nuremberg and McGee hung motionless 10 feet above the water, rotor blades beating dangerously close to overhanging jungle trees. Hearts sank in the aircraft above as those watching guessed the meaning of those stops. The aircraft returned to Arajuno. Once on the ground, Nuremberg, his face showing strain, confirmed suspicions. Speaking in low tones to the tight circle of military men, he explained that McCulley's body, identified by the small party of Kichuas the day before, was now gone from the beach, no doubt washed away by the rain and higher water in the night, he leafed through his notebook for a moment. A few Indians stood silent in the tall grass nearby, listening and watching. We found four in the river. Nuremberg said, finally. I don't think identification will be possible from what I have here, indicating his notebook. One of them may be Macaulay. He did not have to say what was in every mind. There might be one who got away, possibly wounded, still in the jungle. How to inform the wives was the question uppermost in military minds. Should Mary Lou be told? She was right there at Arajuno, in the house. We'd better wait, Nuremberg said. DeWitt is running this show. Let's get back to Shell and talk it over. Captain DeWitt and the big Air Force amphibian was overhead, not wanting to risk a landing on the small strip at Arajuno. All returned to Shell, and the military men gathered in the cabin of the amphibian. The wives would have to be told. But how? Someone else had wisely decided to tell Mary Lou that four bodies had been found. Later in the afternoon, Johnny flew her out to Shell to be with the other four wives. In the end, it was the wives who persuaded DeWitt and Nuremberg that there was no need to soften the blow. We wanted to know everything in detail. We gathered in Marge's bedroom away from the children Major Nuremberg opened his notebook and in tense sentences described what he had found. It was immediately evident that identification could not be positive. One body was caught under the branches of a fallen tree. Only a large foot with a gray sock appeared at the surface of the muddy water. In reading his notes of another, Nuremberg said, this one had on a red belt of some woven material. Four of us turned our eyes toward the fifth, Olive Fleming. That was Pete, Olive said simply. As the major concluded, it was still not known whether Ed's body was one of those in the river. There was still the hope that one might have got away. The military men, to whom the breaking of such news, to loved ones was no new thing, left the bedroom, silently. Their news had been met with serenity. No tears could rise from depth of trust, which supported the wives. Barbara Uderian wrote in her diary, Tonight the captain told us of his finding four bodies in the river. One had t-shirt and blue jeans. Raj was the only one who wore them. God gave me this verse two days ago. Psalm 48 verse 14, For this God is our God for ever and ever, He will be our guide even unto death. As I came face to face with the news of Raj's death, my heart filled with praise. He was worthy of his home going. Help me, Lord, to be both mummy and daddy. To know wisdom and instruction. Tonight Beth prayed for daddy in heaven, and asked me if daddy would come down from heaven to get a letter she wanted to write him. I said, he can't come down. He's with Jesus. She said, but Jesus can help him come down, and God will take his hand so he won't slip. I wrote a letter to the mission family, trying to explain the peace I have. I want to be free of self-pity. It is a tool of Satan to rot away a life. I am sure that this is the perfect will of God. Many will say, why did Raj get mixed up in this when his work was with Javaros? Because Raj came to do the will of him that sent him. The Lord has closed our hearts to grief and hysteria and filled in with his perfect peace. That Thursday night, the ground party pitched camp at El Capricho, the former hacienda where there had been some Aka killings. Throwing up some little leaf shacks, a guard was set up of two missionaries, two soldiers, and two Indians. The missionaries, when not on guard duty with the others, tried to decide the best course of action, knowing, through contact with the helicopter, that four of their colleagues were dead. It was a long night, and Frank Drown felt an old fear that had haunted him all his life of touching the body of a friend, 
here I was, getting nearer and nearer to seeing the bodies of five fellows who were as dear to me as my own brothers. Starting out again at six in the morning on Friday, January 13th, the party was on the last lap of its mission, with a date to meet the helicopter at Palm Beach at 10. The men had to hurry to get there and everyone was jittery from the strain of the trip and the thought of the job that lay ahead. At this point, the course of the Carrare is a series of short, sharp bends and twists and offers an ideal ambush for an Aka attack. At last, the beach was reached. Kichuas were sent up first, as they were best able to spot evidence of recent Aka visits. There was none. The rest of the party followed. I remember, says Frank Drown, that the first thing that struck me as we hit the beach was the smell from a pot of beans that had been overturned and were spread all over. I don't think that I'll ever forget that terrible, rotten smell. There was no sign as yet of the helicopter. The ground party set to work, everyone having been assigned different duties, the Ecuadorian soldiers spread out in a semicircle in the jungle behind the beach to act as cover, two Indians set to digging a common grave under the tree house, others waded into the river looking for the men's possessions. D. Short and Frank Drown crawled up into the tree house to try to find a clue to what had happened. Some of the men began to dismantle the plane, others looked for bodies. It was not until the helicopter arrived at 12.15 and hovered over the bodies where they lay in the muddy waters of the Carare that the ground crew was able to find them. Frank Drown told of the scene. First Nuremberg pointed out one body downstream and Fuller jumped into the water and pulled the body across. Then Nuremberg showed us Nate Saint's body, and we got in a canoe and went downstream, and saw an arm coming out of the water, so I tried to attach a string to the arm and I just could not bring myself to do it. I'd reach out and try, and then pull back, and have to try again until finally, the man who was in the canoe with me did it. Now we were three canoes with three bodies attached to them, going upstream. We laid all four face down in a row on the beach. We never did get the fifth, which was Ed McCulley's body. Then I got over my feeling of hating to touch the bodies, because a body is only a house and these fellows had left their house and, after the soul leaves, the body isn't much after all. The thing that is beautiful to us is the soul, not the body. Identification of the four bodies was finally positive from wedding rings and watches, change purse, notebooks. Ed was not one of the four, so it was finally definite, all five were dead. In the providence of God, the missing body was the one identified by the Kichuas the day before. Not only had they brought back his watch, but also they had taken off one of his shoes, a tremendous shoe, size 13 and one half, and thrown it up on the beach. The day before, Nuremberg had picked it up and brought it back to Shalmera. While the bodies were drawn ashore, a violent tropical storm was gathering. At that moment, the helicopter came in low and fast. Cornell Kappa, a photographer correspondent on assignment for Life magazine, jumped out, camera in hand, and ran across the beach. Then the full fury of the storm struck and the missionaries felt as if the powers of darkness had been let loose. Later Kappa wrote an account of his landing and of subsequent events, we floated above the jungle about 200 feet over the treetops. The naval mission plane circling overhead did not let us out of their sight. Suddenly the sun disappeared and we headed into a tropical storm. The pilot looked grim and wasted, not a minute landing on Palm Beach. The atmosphere on the beach was fantastic. Everybody's hand was on the trigger, looking toward the jungle. I did not have to ask why. The rain was coming down in buckets, my handkerchief served no more to clean my water-soaked lenses. Suddenly, I saw a struggling group of men carrying the last of the missionaries to his common grave. He was on an improvised stretcher, made out of the aluminum sheets that had covered the treehouse where the men had lived. It was a terrible sight. The light was eerie. The pallbearer struggled against a muddy bank that led to the grave. I just made it in time to see the lifeless legs disappearing into the hole. Grim, weary missionaries looked for the last time at their friends, whom they could no more identify. One said, it's better this way. I feel less miserable. They lingered for a moment, offering up a few words of prayer. At the end, Major Nuremberg, facing the jungle, with carbine in hand, turned back toward the small knot of men about the grave and called, let's get out of here. 
The rain let up a bit, the helicopter was ready to leave and the time was near for decision. I could either go back with the pilot or stay with the ground party, starting the overnight homeward trek. It was an easy decision. To leave now would be cheating. I gave my exposed film to the pilot. The struggle of the living to stay alive had just begun. At last, they were off. The canoes were overloaded and at the slightest movement water poured through the side. This was to be no fun at all, I thought quietly to myself. Major Nurnberg was in front with his carbine and I could see from the back of his head that he had a mean look in his eyes. Nurnberg leaned back on D. Short, a red-headed, very long-legged missionary, in a very small boat, who in turn leaned on me, and I leaned on the dismounted wheel of the ill-fated plane which we had salvaged. My back ached. Like a mother hen, I tried to protect my film pouches and to hide my cameras from the rain. It was futile. Soon my rangefinder clouded up. I had to guess the focus. A little later my viewfinder fogged up as well. Now I only aimed the camera and prayed. Like a missionary, that it was pointed in the right direction. In and out of the canoe. Marching with water squelching out of my boots. Anxious eyes everywhere. I unbuttoned my .45 holster. Fortunately, no sign of Akka's. This lasted for about two hours, then it was time to bed down for the night. Major Nuremberg, missionary Drown, and the Ecuadorian under-officer, picked an open site for the camp. Their aim was to give us a chance to spot the Akas, before they had a chance to throw their spears. Guards were posted all around the perimeter and changed every two hours. We had a meal, cooked by one of the missionaries. Shelters were erected from the metal sheets we carried, and palm leaves formed the side walls and the floor. It was a temporary paradise. Missionary Don Johnson, sitting in the darkness of the house, buried his face in his hands, and offered a prayer. He thanked the Lord for helping them to reach and bury their friends. Then, with great feeling, he evoked the modest and loved characters of the departed men. In the darkness of the night, with the firelight flickering on his face, and the sound of jungle birds and puma's groans punctuating the air, this clearly spoken conversation with God was of great emotional impact. Don was not expressing sorrow for the departed so much as testifying to his faith in the Lord's will. When he finished only the crackling of the campfire filled the air. But there was to be no sleep. All through the night we were in a wakeful readiness. The rushing waters of the river Carare were always in the background. There was the sound of an occasional tree falling to set off the trigger fingers of the nervous guards. And at intervals came the beams from their flashlights as the guards made their rounds. Slowly dawn came and our nervousness increased for this was the hour, we had been told, when the Akas liked to attack. Our Indian guide stirred, particularly when they heard the continuing sounds of a puma. The Akas are well known for their clever imitation of the jungle animals, and the guides were sure that in the shadows of the early morning light our neighbors were everywhere. Major Nurnberg crawled forward and with a sudden burst of fire silenced the puma. Breakfast was oatmeal and coffee. Then we collected our gear and the march was on. Dried socks became wet again. Tired feet dragged. The searching eyes and ready fingers of Nuremberg and Drown brought up the rear. Sudden excitement, the chopper appeared overhead, always watched by its big brother, the navies are 4D. Suddenly the twentieth century descended in the wilderness of the jungle. The helicopter had come for me. As I took off I was sorry to leave my friends, but, no, not sorry to leave. On Saturday morning, Captain DeWitt of the Rescue Service asked us five widows if we would care to fly over Palm Beach to see your husband's grave? We replied that if this were not asking too much, we would be grateful. The Navy R4D took us out over the jungle, where the Carare lay like a brown snake in the undulating green. Pressing our faces close to the windows as we knelt on the floor of the plane, we could see the slice of white sand where the piper stood. Olive Fleming recalled the verses that God had impressed on her mind that morning, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, an house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that, whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. As the plane veered away, 
Marge Saint said, that is the most beautiful little cemetery in the world. Chapter 19 Yet have we not forgotten thee. Two days later, we widows, already, we were adjusting ourselves to the use of the word, sat together at the kitchen table in Shelmera. Dr. Art Johnston was describing the finding of the bodies. He had just returned with the weary, straggling ground party. When he hesitated, we urged him to give us all the facts. It was evident that death had been caused by lance wounds. But how had ten Akas managed to overwhelm five strong men who were armed with guns? Over and over we asked ourselves this question. The only possible answer was an ambush. Somehow, the Akas must have succeeded in convincing the men of their peaceful intentions. Nate had assured Marge that they would never allow Akas with spears in their hands to approach them. Perhaps the commission of ten that Nate mentioned on the radio had been a decoy party. Certainly if this party had carried spears, Nate would have reported this, and the men would have not looked forward so eagerly to their arrival. This group may have walked peacefully onto the beach while a second party, carrying spears, moved up under cover of the jungle foliage, to carry out a surprise attack. It seems likely that the missionaries and the unarmed Akas had been mingling together, as they had on the previous Friday, with friendly words and gestures. And then, at a secret signal. There was evidence of a struggle on the beach, marks of Ed's leather heels in the sand, one bullet hole through the windshield of the plane. However, no blood was found. If any Akas had suffered, it was not apparent. Had the men tried to avoid shooting by backing into the river? A lance was found thrust into the sand in the river bottom near the body of Jim Elliot. The fact that all of the bodies were in the water might indicate that they had tried desperately to show the Akas that they would shoot only as a last resort. The condition of the piper showed real malice. Possibly some Akka had punctured the fabric of the plane with a spear, and, finding it vulnerable, had begun to peel it off. Others helped, and soon they had denuded it completely, tossing the strips into the water nearby. But someone intended to put this man carrying bird out of commission once and for all. Some of the framework was bent, and a part of the landing gear, made of tubular steel, was battered in as if by a very heavy object. The propeller and instrument panel, however, were intact. Perhaps to touch the soul of the creature was taboo, but they had torn the stuffing from the seats, as if to disembowel the flying beast. Why, after the overtures of friendship on Friday, had the Akas turned with such sudden and destructive anger on their white visitors on Sunday? The answer can only be guessed. Among the most qualified to venture a guess is Frank Drown, whose work with the Javaros had given him shrewd insight into Indian thinking. He says, an Indian, when he first hears or sees something new, will accept it. Perhaps he accepts merely from normal curiosity, but he does accept. But after he has had time to think about the novelty he begins to feel threatened, and that is the time when he may attack. A group of Indians will sit back and discuss a new contrivance or a new way of doing things with some eagerness, but the witch doctors, who are the real conservatives, can be counted on for rejection. They have a lot of authority, and, when they work on their fellow tribesmen to reject an innovation, the people seldom go contrary to their advice. As in any culture, the younger men may be looking for a new way of life, but the older ones hang on to their traditions and maintain the status quo. Furthermore, most Indians are basically and understandably skeptical of anything the white man offers him. And don't forget that, after all. This was the first time within memory that the Akas have had an encounter with the white man which was completely friendly. We can only hope they are pondering that fact right now. In the kitchen, we sat quietly as the reports were finished, fingering the watches and wedding rings that had been brought back, trying for the hundredth time to picture the scene. Which of the men watched the others fall? Which of them had time to think of his wife and children? Had one been covering the others in the treehouse? and come down in an attempt to save them? Had they suffered long? The answers to these questions remained a mystery. This much we knew, whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. There was no question as to the present state of our loved ones. They were with Christ. And, once more, ancient words from the book of books came to mind, all this has come upon us, yet have we not forgotten thee. Our heart is not turned back, 
neither have our steps declined from thy way, though thou hast sore broken us in the place of dragons, and covered us with the shadow of death. The quiet trust of the mothers helped the children to know that this was not a tragedy. This was what God had planned. I know my daddy is with Jesus, but I miss him, and I wish he would just come down and play with me once in a while, said three-year-old Stevie McCulley. Several weeks later, back in the States, Stevie's little brother, Matthew, was born. One day the baby was crying and Stevie was heard to say, Never you mind, when we get to heaven I'll show you which one is our daddy. Was the price too great? To the world at large, this was a sad waste of five young lives, but God had his plan and purpose in all things. There were those whose lives were changed by what happened on Palm Beach. In Brazil, a group of Indians at a mission station deep in the Mato Grosso, upon hearing the news, dropped to their knees and cried out to God for forgiveness for their own lack of concern for fellow Indians who did not know of Jesus Christ. From Rome, an American official wrote to one of the widows, I knew your husband. He was to me the ideal of what a Christian should be. An Air Force major stationed in England, with many hours of jet flying, immediately began making plans to join the Missionary Aviation Fellowship. A missionary in Africa wrote, Our work will never be the same. We knew two of the men. Their lives have left their mark on ours. Off the coast of Italy, an American naval officer was involved in an accident at sea. As he floated alone on a raft, he recalled Jim Elliott's words, which he had read in a news report, when it comes time to die, make sure that all you have to do is die. He prayed that he might be saved, knowing that he had more to do than die. He was not ready. God answered his prayer, and he was rescued. In Des Moines, Iowa, an 18-year-old boy prayed for a week in his room, then announced to his parents, I'm turning my life over completely to the Lord. I want to try to take the place of one of those five. Letters poured into the five widows, from a college in Japan, we are praying for you, from a group of Eskimo children in a Sunday school in Alaska, from a Chinese church in Houston, from a missionary on the Nile River who had picked up Time magazine and seen a photograph of her friend, Ed McCulley. Only eternity will measure the number of prayers which ascended for the widows, their children, and the work in which the five men had been engaged. The prayers of the widows themselves are for the Akas. We look forward to the day when these savages will join us in Christian praise. Plans were promptly formulated for continuing the work of the martyrs. The station of Arajuno was manned to be ready in case the Akas should come out for friendly contact. Gift flights were resumed by Johnny Keenan so that the Akas would know, beyond any doubt, that the white man had nothing but the friendliest of motives. Revenge? The thought never crossed the mind of one of the wives or other missionaries. Barbara Uderian returned to her work among the Javaros, with the two little children, and I went back to Shandia with ten-month-old Valerie to carry on as much as I could of the work of the Kichua station. Another pilot, Hobie Lawrence, with his family and a new plane, were sent to the mission airbase in Shelmera, while Marge Saint took up a new post in Quito. After the birth of her third son in the United States, a few weeks after the death of her husband, Mary Lou McCulley returned to Ecuador with her boys to work in Quito with Marge. For Olive Fleming, who had spent only two months in the jungle when her husband died, the problem regarding the future has been more difficult. But for her, as for all, one thing is certain, her life belongs to God, as had her husband's, and he will show the way. In the months since the killing of the five men, Nate Saint's sister Rachel has continued with the study of the Aka language, working with the Aka woman, Dayuma. Many flights have been made over the houses of the Akas. The first group of houses was found to have been burned, a common Aka practice after a killing, but not far away new houses were discovered, and gifts were dropped to the waiting Indians. When Johnny Keenan swoops over, George appears, jumping and waving the little model plane given him by Nate Saint. Delilah also seems to be there with him. Patches of bright yellow fabric from Nate's plane adorn the roofs of some of the houses. Thousands of people in all parts of the world pray every day that the light of the knowledge of the glory of God may be carried to the Akas, a people almost totally unheard of before. How can this be done? God, who led the five, will lead others, in his time and way. From among the Kichuas with whom Jim, Ed, and Pete worked, several have surrendered their lives to God for his use, to preach to their own people, 
or even to the Akas, if he chooses. They have carried on the work begun by the missionaries, speaking to their relatives of Christ, reading the scriptures that have been translated for them, traveling sometimes in canoes and over muddy trails to teach the Bible to others who do not know its message. A converted Indian, formerly a notorious drinker, came to me one day and said, Senora, I lie awake at night thinking of my people, how will I reach them? I say. How will they hear of Jesus? I cannot get to them all. But they must know. I pray to God, asking him to show me what to do. In the little prayer meetings the Indians never forget to ask God to bless their enemies, O oh God, you know how those Akas killed our beloved Señor Eduardo, Señor Jamie, and Señor Pedro. O oh God, you know that it was only because they didn't know you. They didn't know what a great sin it was. They didn't understand why the white men had come. Send some more M.E.S. singers, and give the Akas, instead of fierce hearts, soft hearts. Stick their hearts, Lord, as with a lance. They stuck our friends, but you can stick them with your word, so that they will listen, and believe. For the wives and relatives of the five men, the mute longing of their hearts was echoed by words found in Jim Elliot's diary, I walked out to the hill just now. It is exalting, delicious, to stand embraced by the shadows of a friendly tree with the wind tugging at your coattail and the heavens hailing your heart, to gaze and glory and give oneself again to God, what more could a man ask? Oh, the fullness, pleasure, sheer excitement of knowing God on earth. I care not if I never raise my voice again for him, if only I may love him, please him. Mayhap in mercy, he shall give me a host of children that I may lead them through the vast star fields to explore his delicacies whose finger ends set them to burning. But if not, if only I may see him, touch his garments, and smile into his eyes, ah then, not stars nor children shall matter, only himself. O oh Jesus, Master, and Center, and End of all, how long before that glory is thine which has so long waited thee, now there is no thought of thee among men, then there shall be thought for nothing else. Now other men are praised, then none shall care for any other's merits. Hasten, hasten, glory of heaven, take thy crown, subdue thy kingdom, enthrall thy creatures. Epilogue November 1958 Nearly three years have passed since that Sunday afternoon. Today I sit in a tiny leaf-thatched hut on the Tawana River, not many miles southwest of Palm Beach. In another leaf house, just about ten feet away, sit two of the seven men who killed my husband. Gakita, one of the men, has just helped Valerie, who is now three and one-half, roast a plantain. Two of his sons have gone to the forest, shouldering their skillfully made blowguns in search of meat to feed the fifteen or twenty Aka Indians who are at present in this clearing. How did this come to be? Only God who made iron swim, who caused the sun to stand still in whose hand is the breath of every living thing, only this God, who is our God forever and ever, could have done it. After the death of the five men the pilots of the Missionary Aviation Fellowship continued making gift drops to the Akas. Apparent friendliness on their part was unchanged, but we know now that we could never base our judgment of their attitudes on that. Rachel Saint, sister of Nate, the pilot, patiently keeps on with her study of the Aka language with the help of Deuma who came to know the Lord Jesus and began to pray, with thousands of others, for the entrance of the light to her tribe. One day in November, 1957, I was at the McCulley's former station, Arajuno, when two Quechua Indians from the Karare River arrived to tell us that there were two Aka women at their house. I went with them immediately, and there at the Quechua settlement where the rescue party had spent a night, I met Mankamu and Mintaka. Mintaka was the older of the two women who had come to Palm Beach. Later, these two women went with me back to Shandia, where I began the study of their language, praying constantly that the Lord would take us into their tribe. His answer came first in a promise, which he gave from Nehemiah 9 verse 19 and 24, Yet thou in thy manifold mercies forsookest them not in the wilderness, the pillar of the cloud departed not from them by day, to lead them in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night, to shew them light and the way wherein they should go. So the children went in and possessed the land, and thou subdidst before them the inhabitants of the land, and gavest them into their hands. When Rachel and Deuma returned from a visit to the United States, 
we went to see them, and the three Aka women, united after more than twelve years, started to talk of returning to their people together. This they did, on September 3, 1958. Remaining among them for three weeks, telling them of the kind foreigners they had come to love, the three returned once more to Arajuno where Marge Saint and I were waiting for them. They brought with them seven other Akas, and an invitation for Rachel and me to come and live with them in the tribe. Thus, on October 8, 1958, we arrived. The longed for entrance had been made. The Akas were friendly and helpful, receiving us as sisters, building us houses, sharing their meat and manioc. They say they killed the men only because they believed them to be cannibals. Basically, it was fear that led them to what they now regard as a mistake. But we know that it was no accident. God performs all things according to the counsel of his own will. The real issues at stake on January 8, 1956, were very far greater than those which immediately involved five young men and their families, or this small tribe of naked savages. Letters from many countries have told of God's dealings with hundreds of men and women, through the example of five who believed literally that the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth for ever. So, with this entrance, we ask that those who have helped us by prayer will continue. We would remind you that it is only an entrance. Besides this group of fifty or so with whom we have contact, there is a downriver group who are the mortal enemies of these. Will God also lead us into that strong city? Thou art worthy. For thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, and tongue, and people, and nation. Epilogue 2 January 1996 This time it's not a leaf-thatched hut on the Tawana River, but a small house with big glass windows and real walls high above the Atlantic Ocean on Massachusetts' rock-bound coast. I sit at my desk, looking out at a nearly pure white sea reflecting a white sky, with no horizon to divide them. A winter sun makes a pale, shimmering pathway on the calm water, where two little boats idle as the lobstermen pull their pots. It is a long way from the jungle. Although the pathway of my life has taken many unimagined turns since I wrote this, my first, book, I have not been allowed to forget the story. I would not have wanted to forget it, but there have been times when I have wondered if others might. Perhaps they have tired of it. Should I continue the retelling as I am so often asked to do? I spoke of my misgivings to Miss Cory Ten Boom, who, as an old lady, indefatigably traveled the world to tell her own story over and over again, of her family's providing refuge to Jews in Holland during World War II, of their being betrayed and imprisoned in a concentration camp, and of the deaths of her sister and aged father as a result. Sometimes, she told me, I have said, Lord, I must have something fresh. I cannot go on telling the old story. But the Lord said to me, This is the story I gave you. You tell that one. So Corey encouraged me to go on telling mine. Readers will want to know what has happened to the people in this book. It is easy enough to answer the questions about the widows. Two of them are still in Ecuador. Marge Saint is now Mrs. A. Van der Puy, wife of the former president of HCJB World Radio in Quito. They have six children between them and an impressive crowd of grandchildren. Barbara Udirian ran a missionary guest house for the Gospel Missionary Union before returning to live in Orlando, Florida. She has two married children, Beth and Jerry. Mary Lou McCulley is retired as a hospital accounting supervisor and lives in Bonnie Lake, Washington. All of her sons are married, Steve, who is a schoolteacher, and Matt, a sports writer. Mike, the middle one, travels around the country working with racehorses. Olive Fleming married Walter Liefeld, who is now retired as head of the New Testament Department at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Deerfield, Illinois. They have three children, David, Beverly, and Holly. Rachel Saint died of cancer in November 1994 and was buried in the Warani settlement where she had lived for a number of years. My third husband, the second died of cancer, is Lars Gren, who, when he is not managing me and our travel and book sales, works for a private foundation. My daughter, Valerie, is the mother of several children. Her husband, Walter D. Shepard, Jr., is a pastor. It is difficult not to grasp after thrills. 
The publicity surrounding the deaths of the five men focused what has sometimes seemed to be undue attention on that small jungle group, deflecting, some said, much interest from other vital kinds of missionary work. There can be little doubt that the drama of the story awakened many to the existence of harvest fields they had not thought of. At least hundreds were jolted by the sacrifice of five young men, for whom obedience to their Lord was quite literally a matter of life and death. In a civilization where, in order to be sure of their manhood, or, alas, even their personhood, men must box, lift weights, play football, jog, rappel, or hang glide, it was startling to realize that there was such a thing as spiritual commitment as robust, as total, and perhaps more demanding than the most fanatical commitment to physical fitness. It was a shock to learn that anybody cared that much about anything, especially if it was invisible. On January 8, 1996, my husband, Lars Gren, and I, along with my daughter, Valerie, her husband, Walt, and eldest son, Walter, were with the Warani. Steve Saint, pilot and son of pilot Nate, and his wife, Ginny, kindly entertained us in their jungle home on the Karari River. We sat in hammocks as the Warani crowded in to see us, to laugh and shout about how much I, Jakari, and Valerie, Mangari, had aged. They did their best to pronounce Lars, Walt, and Walter, welcoming them with great glee, powerful handshakes, and deepest interest. Together, we reminisced about the years 1958 to 1960 that Valerie and I had lived there. Minkai and Kimo, two of those who had speared the five, talked and talked, telling me of events over the decades since I had seen them. They are Christians now. The New Testament has been translated into their language. The name Aka is a Quechua word meaning naked or savage. It is no longer used. Warani is what the people call themselves. Their story, at the time of the death of the men, later when I lived with the Indians themselves, and during all the years since as I have recounted it and reflected on it in the light of my own subsequent experience, has pointed to one thing, God is God. If he is God, he is worthy of my worship and my service. I will find rest nowhere but in his will, and that will is infinitely, immeasurably, unspeakably beyond my largest notions of what he is up to. This is the context in which the story must be understood, as one incident in human history, an incident in certain ways and to certain people important, but only one incident. God is the God of human history, and He is at work continuously, mysteriously, accomplishing His eternal purposes in us, through us, for us, and in spite of us. There is always the urge to oversimplify, to weigh in at once with interpretations that cannot possibly cover all the data or stand up to close inspection. We know, for example, that time and again in the history of the Christian Church, the blood of martyrs has been its seed. So we are tempted to assume a simple equation here. Five men died. This will mean X number of Warani Christians. Perhaps so. Perhaps not. Cause and effect are in God's hands. Is it not the part of faith simply to let them rest there? God is God. I dethrone him in my heart if I demand that he act in ways that satisfy my idea of justice. It is the same spirit that taunted, if thou be the son of God, come down from the cross. There is unbelief, there is even rebellion, in the attitude that says, God has no right to do this to five men unless. Those men had long since given themselves without reservation to do the will of God. So far as they knew, they were to be plain ordinary missionaries, Raj to the Atuaras, Jim, Ed, and Pete to the Kichuas, Nate to serve all the jungle stations with his airplane. But small things happen, Nate found some inhabited Warani houses, small decisions are made, he told Jim and Ed, which lead to bigger ones, they began to pray with new vigor for an entrance into the territory, and ultimately a man's individual choices become momentous. Plain, ordinary missionaries with wives and children whom they loved found themselves faced with a life-and-death decision. They were not looking for anything bigger to do, let alone for fame. The need of the Waranese simply became the categorical imperative. For us widows, the question as to why the men who had trusted God to be both shield and defender should be allowed to be speared to death was not one that could be smoothly or finally answered in 1956, nor yet silenced in 1996. God did not answer Job's questions either. Job was living in a mystery, the mystery of the sovereign purpose of God 
and the questions that rose out of the depths of that mystery were answered only by a deeper mystery, that of God himself. The Lord answered Job out of the tempest. Who is this whose ignorant words cloud my design in darkness? Brace yourself and stand up like a man, I will ask questions and you shall answer. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me, if you know and understand. Who settled its dimensions? Job 38 verses 1 to 4, NEB. On and on the unanswerable questions went, overwhelming the man on the ash heap with proofs of divine control, origin, generation, legislation, authority, and wisdom. Job's only reply was that he had none. What reply can I give thee, I who carry no weight? I put my finger to my lips, 40, colon 4. Again God told him to brace himself, stand up like a man, and answer. Dare you deny that I am just or put me in the wrong, that you may be right? 40, colon 8, Job stood the test. He recognized who God is. He melted. But he then became the intercessor for his friends, and God restored to him more than he had ever had to begin with. I believe with all my heart that God's story has a happy ending. Julian of Norwich wrote, All shall be well, and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. But not yet, not necessarily yet. It takes faith to hold on to that in the face of the great burden of experience, which seems to prove otherwise. What God means by happiness and goodness is a far higher thing than we can conceive. John Oman said that a true belief in providence cannot be held either as an instinctive trust that God is kind or as an inference from life that he is benevolent, but only as the last and highest victory of a faith which has won a vision of a true and abiding good, which is not of the world, even while things in the world become a new creation to forward it, grace and personality, p. 126 ff. The massacre was a hard fact, widely reported at the time, surprisingly well remembered, by many even today. It was interpreted according to the measure of one's faith or faithlessness, full of meaning or empty. A triumph or a tragedy. An example of brave obedience or a case of fathomless foolishness. The beginning of a great work, a demonstration of the power of God, a sorrowful first act that would lead to a beautifully predictable third act in which all puzzles would be solved. God would vindicate himself, Warrenese would be converted, and we could all feel good about our faith. Bulletins about progress were hailed with joy and a certain amount of awe. You see. But the danger lies in seizing upon the immediate and hoped for, as though God's justice is thereby verified, and glossing over as neatly as possible certain other consequences, some of them inevitable, others simply the result of a botched job. In short, in the Warani story as in other stories, we are consoled as long as we do not examine too closely the unpalatable data. By this evasion we are willing still to call the work ours, to arrogate to ourselves whatever there is of success, and to deny all failure. A healthier faith seeks a reference point outside all human experience, the pole star which marks the course of all human events, not forgetting that impenetrable mystery of the interplay of God's will and man's, e.g., he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Jesus was handed over to the power of men, thou hast set me free to range at will. I think back to the five men themselves, remembering Pete's agony of indecision as to whether he should join the others in the venture, Ed's eagerness to go even though Mary Lou was eight months pregnant, his strong assurance that all would be well, Rod's depression and deep sense of failure as a missionary, Nate's extreme caution and determination, Jim's nearly reckless exuberance. I think of the tensions that developed after the men died among those who had to try to pick up the pieces of the work they had left behind. There was misunderstanding between some of the mission boards as to what part each was to play in continuing efforts to reach the Warrenese. I think of how, when Rachel and I finally arrived in the Warrenese jungle clearing, we found that what she and Dayuma had been using as the Warani language was not readily understood. Dayuma had forgotten a large part of it, and had unwittingly jumbled up Warani, Quechua, a smattering of Spanish, and a little English intonation for good measure. Then gradually I saw, to my dismay, that Rachel's approach to linguistic work, her interpretation of what the Indians did and said, and the resulting reports she sent out were often radically different from my own. I think of the Indians themselves, what bewilderment, what inconvenience, what disorientation, what uprooting, what actual disease, polio, for example, they suffered because we missionaries got to them at last. 
The skeptic points with glee to such woeful facts and we dodge them nimbly, fearing any assessment of the work that may cast suspicion at least on the level of our spirituality if not the validity of our faith. But we are sinners. And we are buffoons. I am reminded of an occasion in Bible school when I nearly laughed aloud in the middle of a prayer, following a long session in which one student after another had confessed his sins, real and imaginary, our principal, L. E. Maxwell, stood up and boomed out, O oh Lord, deliver us from our sad, sweet, stinking selves. It is not the level of our spirituality that we can depend on. It is God and nothing less than God. For the work is God's and the call is God's and everything is summoned by Him and to His purposes, the whole scene, the whole mess, the whole package, our bravery and our cowardice, our love and our selfishness, our strengths and our weaknesses. The God who could take a murderer like Moses and an adulterer like David and a traitor like Peter and make of them strong servants of His is a God who can also redeem savage Indians using as the instruments of His peace a conglomeration of sinners who sometimes look like heroes and sometimes like villains. For, we are no better than pots of earthenware to contain this treasure, the revelation of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, and this proves that such transcendent power does not come from us, but is God's alone, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7, NEB. We are not always sure where the horizon is. We would not know which end is up were it not for the shimmering pathway of light falling on the white sea. The one who laid earth's foundations and settled its dimensions knows where the lines are drawn. He gives all the light we need for trust and for obedience.